Hello and welcome to the final session of the Climate Culture Peace Conference. This session is called Heritage in Climate Action, Stepping Forward in Policy, Research and Practice. And it is available in Arabic and French. If you would like to hear it in Arabic or French, please check yes. the globe. Uh, look at your Zoom window. At the bottom of your Zoom window, you have a globe sign and just uh, click on that uh, icon and you will be able to hear it in your desired language. I'm Aparna Tanna and I'm your host for this session. I'm a senior program leader at ECRON, leading its uh, program flagship program FAR, which is first aid and resilience in times of crisis, the World Cultural Heritage in times of crisis. Climate culture peace is envisioned as uh, part of the long-term strategic action of the FAR program, and it is strengthened by 55 partners from 33 countries representing six sectors. This initiative is generously supported by British Council's Cultural Protection Fund in partnership with the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport. Uh, our focus is on safeguarding the cultural and natural heritage of those communities who are on the front lines of the climate emergency, yet who have knowledges and lived experiences to inform the global climate action. And now, uh, since we have uh, this, this conference started on 24th of January, and since then 400, 1,440 uh, uh, participants have joined us, I would like to share uh, some uh, statistics with you. Which... So as you can uh, you know, see the conference in numbers, this conference has given us a rich mosaic of ideas, stories, and experiences, which overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly support the idea that heritage has a definitive role to play in understanding the root causes of climate crisis and help in reducing inequality, mitigating risks, and build peace as well as contribute to climate action. And to put all that in words and to show how what hopes and, and to share the hopes and aspirations of the conference participants, we started an activity called Hopescape. To introduce the Hopescape, I, in, I would like to invite my colleague, Kelly Haziager, who will, uh, you know, share these uh, hopescape with you, and also explain what, how this came together, how this, how this initiative came together. Over to Kelly. Thank you very much, Aparna. Uh, so, Mahona, if you could uh, briefly share. Yes, thank you very much. So, this very colorful word cloud is our hopescape, which is a shared vision for our futures and our heritage. So this uh, initiative came about as we invited all conference attendees to contribute to this hopescape, which is like a collage of visions for the future of heritage. And it started very small with an activity with uh, at a climate open mic with about 20 to 30 people. But as you can see, it's grown beyond that as we invited everyone to contribute. And this hopescape is a landscape of hopes for the future as we need hope in order to inspire us to action and we need a motivator and we need hope as something to hold on to even in the face of conflicts and a global and complex issue like climate change. So driving this exercise was a people-centered approach to heritage where we consider first how people feel connected to their heritage. 
So the question that we asked, and if anyone would like to still contribute to this, it's a growing initiative. The question that we asked to guide Imagining the Future was, what would you want your heritage to feel, taste, and look like in 30 years? What do you want your legacy to be? Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll be able to share this hopescape also through the conference website. And now, uh, as we had started the, this conference with the uh, recorded message from the uh, Honorable Minister for Communication and uh, uh, Justice and Foreign Affairs from Tuvalu. Similarly, this uh, to conclude the conference, we have a statement uh, from Honorable Minister from of uh, Deputy Minister of Ministry of Tourism, Arts and Culture, Ghana, uh, Honorable Mr. Mark Okaraku Mante, and uh, we are really grateful to our partners. Uh, in Ghana, especially uh, the UNESCO Ghana, for uh, helping us in uh, liaising with the minister's office. So let's uh, let's watch what uh, the um, the message of the deputy minister. My name is Mark Okrekumante, deputy minister for tourism, art, and culture, and I'm speaking on behalf of the minister, Dr. Ibrahim Awa. Allow me to point out at the outset that the government of Ghana congratulates the International Center for the Study of the Preservation and Restoration of Cultural Property, ICCROM, and her partners for organizing this significant conference to address the challenges that the observed negative effects of climate change have for cultural and natural heritages that may impact peace in the world at large and in local communities in specific ways. The conference coming on at this time is therefore considered opportune because of the relevance of its objectives that coincide with the strategic priorities and objectives of Ghana's multi-stakeholder heritage strategic framework 2022 to 2025, which has recently been developed and launched by my ministry for their attention and implementation by all significant stakeholders. It is worth noting that this framework is the first of its kind in the South region. Informed by expert reports and general information from the mass media, it is now a common knowledge that there are indications of the fa factuality of the negative effects of climate change in Ghana and in the West Africa South region. Some of these negative effects coming from, for example, rising sea water levels threaten the continuous existence and sustainability of some Ghanaian coastal settlements in which are located heritage buildings and important heritage sites, including some of the significant 28 number of world heritage sites. Such observed negative consequent effects of climate change will contribute to the erosion and destruction of these heritage sites, which will not augur well for the Ghanaian heritage resource with dire consequences, not only for our national economy, but for the well-being of individual families and communities. Furthermore, these negative effects are also threatening some significant flora and fauna habitats in which, for example, mangroves are found that serve as sacred groups for local community cultural practices and home of rare birds and livestock are being inundated. As a result of the rising of the sea water levels, ecological sanctuaries on the beaches where fauna such as rare West African marine turtles and the small crustaceans such as ghost sand crabs nest and thrive are being degraded coupled with the bad and adverse human hunting and harvesting practices. In response to the awareness of the manifested existence of these negative effects and consequences of climate change, in preparation of the seminar Ghanaian Multi Stakeholder Heritage Strategic Framework, due consideration has proactively been made to address the above mentioned threats that can ill affect the fortunes that our cherished cultural and natural heritages have for our identity as Ghanaians and the development and sustenance of our national economy which the present government, led by President Nana Adudankwa Ekufuado, 
is rigorously pursuing in line with sustainable development goals. I conclude in this light that Ghana subscribes to the spirit and objectives of this international conference on climate, culture, and peace. I am glad to have participated in this conference, which seeks to change the narrative of our current climate situation. I thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Up next are a series of Ignite talks uh, that recognize the intersectionality intersectionality of the issues that we are confronted with and uh, are examples of how we can use culture and heritage to develop research and actions on the ground that can contribute to sustainability and mitigation as well as adaptation. Uh, my, it's my pleasure and honor to uh, invite uh, Ozgen uh, from Turkey, Izmir Metropolitan Municipality, to present her uh, project. It's called uh, Cooling. I, I think I, I cannot pronounce it very well. I let Ozgen pronounce the the project. It's uh, so over to Ozgen. <clears throat> Hello, uh, it's a pleasure for me uh, to present this project on behalf of Izmir Metropolitan Municipality to you. Can you see the slides? Yes, we can. Yes. Uh, the project is called Cooling Kemeralta, uh, and as an implementation uh, area, Howard Street is chosen. Uh, Kemeralta and its surrounding is the old city center of Izmir. It has been inhabited, inhabited since Hellenistic period. Uh, the old city was a small port town located on the outskirts of Kadife Kale, uh, which was filled in 17th century. Uh, the Howard Street of Kemeralta connects the uh, bazaar to the uh, Agora. Uh, Kemeralta and its surrounding area has been added to the UNESCO World Heritage Tentative List uh, with the name the Historical Port City of Izmir in 2020. Izmir uh, has Mediterranean climate that is hot and sunny in summer. The Hara Street is exposed to the direct sunlight most of the day in Izmir. Uh, the project proposes to develop the adaptation and mitigation strategies against climate change effect via a green canopy design. The design requires sustainable, sustainable and innovative systems and materials. And the main objectives of the project is the reduction of both heat island effect and carbon emissions, the transfer of historical knowledge from past to the future, uh, to achieve harmony between nature and cultural heritage. And the project will contribute to, to the circular economy model. And uh, the canopy could also serve as a station for collecting and monitoring data. The structure could use as a dashboard for knowledge transfer to inhabitants. Traditionally, some of the streets and exterior walls of the buildings has been covered in ivy. And it's the place, uh, the Howard district, the pilot implementation area is the Howard Street. A, a canopy made of flame proof was installed in the, on the street. It's a freestanding structure designed with lighting systems that doesn't touch the existing buildings. Integrated sewer and storm water lines were separated. All infrastructure was renewed. All payments were renewed with Bergama granite stones unique to the region. Sodium steam, all street lightings were replaced with catenary LED lightings. As I mentioned, the traditionally the sun shades and tarpaulins uh, are widely used throughout Kemal Bazaar, which is hot and sunny in summer. In the implementation, 11 ivy uh, was planted. Today, uh, we couldn't um, ma manage to prepare the um, dashboard yet, but we will prepare. Uh, and we couldn't uh, put the um, sensors on the streets. With the project, uh, the urban, urban cooling will be achieved by the green canopy. Uh, the need of using air conditioning for the buildings facing the cool streets will be decreased, so does their energy consumption. Besides, the mitigation of carbon emission and air pollution will decrease the damage on historical building envelopes. 
The wastewater reduction will be achieved by using recycling systems such as rainwater or grey water. On the other hand, the green canopy will increase the biodiversity in the urban area. Supporting the continuity of commercial facilities in the historical district in a healthier way will extend the life cycle of the historical building stock. The dashboard, which is based on open source and low cost software and new technologies, uh, will support the sharing knowledge philosophy for monitoring cultural health and climate change effects. Uh, it will provide access to understandable data for both governments and citizens. It was challenging to make consensus with uh, shopkeepers on the location of the ivy and the columns of the canopy close to their shops during the implementation. All excavations were carried out at night, outside the working hours. Since the project area is an urban and archaeological site, the excavations were meticulously carried out under the supervision of uh, the museum. Izmir Metropolitan Municipality was the main contractor. In the future, the recycling technology will be applied in the irrigation system, sensors will be placed, dashboard will be created, and the cool streets will be increased over time, and alternative circulation paths uh, will be created in the old city center. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Next. Uh... We, I would like to present uh, Mr. Nick uh, Shepard from University of Pretoria. And his topic is walking as embodied research in emergent Anthropocene landscapes. So over to Nick. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank Marcy and Aparna for the invitation to be part of this event. And I should note that um, my affiliation is Aarhus University and uh, the University of Pretoria. Uh, I've got five minutes, so let's, uh, let's cut to it. In 2014, I began a program of walking seminars together with my collaborators, Christian Ernsten, a researcher at Maastricht University, and Dokian Fisser, a documentary photographer based in The Hague. Since then, we have held many walking seminars, initially in Southern Africa, where I was based at the time, and more recently in Amsterdam, Berlin, the Austrian Alps, the coastline of Northern Spain. In fact, anywhere where we can find a local partner and an issue that we want to address together. The formula for the walking seminars is simple. We invite a mixed group of scholars, artists, curators, policymakers, and activists. Each seminar has a theme, for example, one of our first seminars focused on the legacies of colonialism and apartheid in the landscapes of the Cape in South Africa. Another looked at the combined threats of wildfires and droughts in the context of the day zero drought, which menaced Cape Town at that time and made global headlines. The seminars last between one and five days and passages of walking are interspersed with workshop sessions, drop-in visits by local researchers and practitioners, communal cooking, and hanging out and having fun. We ask each participant to share with the group their way of working, the kinds of methods and ideas that inspire them and that they find useful. We also ask that they produce a piece of work coming out of the walking seminar. This can be in any format, a research paper, a musical score, poetry, a photo documentation. As conveners, we undertake to get this work published and distributed. Convening the seminars over many years, we have found that it's important to create flat hierarchies. For example, between researchers and artists, or between policymakers and activists. It's also important to create the conditions where people can open out to one another, to the landscapes that they're walking through and to the act of walking itself. And so what inspired this interest in walking as a research method and mode of engagement? My career has been a fairly as, has been as a fairly conventional researcher with a background in archaeology and heritage studies, 
at different times in my career. I've been based at Harvard, at Brown, at the University of Basel, at the University of Cape Town, and now at Aarhus University. I feel like I know academic formats well. A few years ago, I attended what I think of as my last big academic conference in Hangzhou, China, and many of you were there. You all know the scenario. You fly thousands of kilometers, you stay in a fancy hotel, which makes you feel uncomfortable because of the unaccustomed level of luxury. You spend five days getting to know the inside of a conference venue really well, and then you fly home again. I'm not convinced that this format is as necessary as we used to think it to be. Even the ostensible reason that many of us give for attending conferences, the informal conversations with colleagues and friends were conversations that could have happened elsewhere by other means. Besides the format of the big international conference, other formats have been thrown into question for me. I have a growing awareness of the limitations of what I've come to think of as the white cube of the seminar room. This is an environment which encourages a particular kind of relationship with knowledge, abstract, disembodied, dispassionate. It also requires that we exclude many contexts and relationships from the knowledge relationship. For example, relationships of memory, of experience, questions of imagination and desire, and the evidence of our senses. I spent many years teaching in the Center for African Studies at the University of Cape Town. In a typical seminar room, you would have black students from the townships who had woken up at 4 a.m. to catch dangerous and unreliable public transport to get to campus, often worried about money, worried about personal safety, and so on. In the same class, you would have middle-class students from the suburbs whose parents had bought them a car for their 18th birthday, who drove to campus, and who were focused on very different matters. And yet, the fiction was that we were all somehow inhabiting this space in equivalent ways. As we carried out our exercises in close readings of the set text, usually an English language text, we excluded from the conversation the very things that conditioned the experience of daily life for many students. What it means to inhabit a raced and gendered body at a particular level of income in a particular relationship with power and privilege in these colonial and post-colonial worlds. There are many ways of addressing this conundrum of not only what we learn, but how we learn. For us, the walking seminars have been a way to explore formats for other kinds of conversations and collaborations. We like the slow pace of walking, the kind of temporality that it imposes, and the invitation to attentiveness. We also like that walking is sometimes hard work. In our conventional lives, there is a great emphasis on the idea that things should be accessible. But sometimes encountering things that are a little bit inaccessible can be rewarding and generative. It feels important to us that walking engages the body and the senses, and that we are fully present and involved in the situations that we encounter, not just passive spectators as we so often seem to be cast. We are inspired by Anand Singh writing about the arts of noticing and by Isabel Stenger's arguments in favor of a notion of slow science. We are also inspired by the wonderful body of work on walking, beginning with Rebecca Solnit and Tim Ingold, and by the many artists and activators and activists who use walking as creative practice as political intervention and as act of solidarity. I'm gonna skip ahead because time is running out. Thank you. Most of all, we've been motivated by our growing awareness of the climate emergency and by the understanding that each of us is called to rethink our practices in fundamental ways in the light of this emergency. 
this is not a reality that should be engaged long range dispassionately, but rather up close, passionately in ways that are personally involved and implicated. We need to spend less time staring into screens and more time paying attention to the world around us. Familiar landscapes are changing and degrading under the pressure of drought, flooding and wildfire. Biodiversity has been hollowed out and habitats destroyed. Much of this destruction has happened in the last 50 years, the space of my lifetime. The tragedy is that so few people who are materially comfortable seem to notice or care. Walking in such a landscape becomes a valedictory act, an act of respect and a call to action. Our biggest challenge lies in closing the gap between climate change awareness and climate change action. By now, many people have at least a general understanding that climate change poses an existential threat. And yet for many of us, it continues to be business as usual. Part of the problem lies with how we approach the whole business of knowledge itself. As distanced, dispassionate, objective observers, as bystanders, in other words. I have come to understand that we need to approach knowledge differently. There are no safe vantage points. There's no way to keep our hands clean. We are all of us involved, implicated, and entangled. Closing the gap between climate awareness and climate action means transforming the climate emergency from something that we know abstractly in our minds to something that we feel urgently in our bodies and in our beings. The walking seminar is a kind of experiment in which we try to do exactly that. Thank you very much. In closing, um, I, would like you, I would like to invite you to contact me if you are at all curious about the walking seminar as methodology. We have lots of plans and lots of dreams, and we would like to invite you to dream along with us. Thank you, Thank you Nick, for that inspiring presentation. Moving on from embodied research to sustainable tourism management systems. And to present, uh, I would like to invite Shayan Shang Yun from Seychelles Islands Foundation. Over to Shayan. Hey, thank you, Apana. I'm sharing my screen now. All right. So, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Cheyenne. I'm representing the Seychelles Island Foundation in based in Seychelles. And today, um, We'll be presenting about sustainable tourism management system in the UNESCO World Heritage Site of Valle de Mai in Seychelles, which is a project funded by the Netherlands Funds in Trust, a financial partner of UNESCO. Okay, so getting straight to it, um, the Valle de Mai is a natural world UNESCO heritage site based on the in Seychelles, a small country based um, off the east coast of Africa in the Indian Ocean. And it is located in the second largest island of Seychelles, where it is um, nicely nestled in the national park of the island. And so it creates, um, it is created by a nice buffer of the Pale um, coastal area. So uh, looking at it, it is a natural forest with um, an ancient realm of unique species that has shown evolution over millions of years, um, significant amount of time given for evolution. And it is, it is in fact one of the smallest natural world UNESCO heritage sites which spreads um, around 19.5 hectares over the Pale Island. And it is also home to the world's largest nut, um, the Coco de Mer. Also, it is home to several endemic species, such as the Seychelles black parrot, uh, the trachygaster, the Seychelles blue pigeon, the Seychelles kestrels, and the bulbul, and so on. And so it is also heart of the Seychelles culture. So looking at how 
climate change is impacting Valedme as a World UNESCO heritage site, it is indeed, it has a significant effect on one of our key natural laboratory sites, which is known for highly known for its high endemism. And of course, when we see climate change, it is directly linked to the increasing threats that invasive alien species bring, such as the yellow crazy ants, the YCA, which we are actively working on right now to sort of mitigate and control its um, threats that is occurring on such endemic species such as the Seychelles black parrot. And of course it will all, um, it already is having significant changes in our ec ecological and resource processes such as our body system, our water body system, um, which not only the site depends upon, but the whole island. And so another factor of climate change is that it, it is a direct link, directly linked to, to the tourism industry, whereby the acti activities that the tourism industry brings to the site acts as an accelerator for the activities that um, climate change brings about. Okay, so um, this project is aimed directly, uh, not only this project, but uh, the site itself is aimed directly to involve culture heritage because it provides a key livelihood for our Seychelles people. And also it provides a massive and significant historical and cultural value amongst our communities. And so this creates creates a significant platform for our Creole lifestyle, such as our Creole festivities and our Creole festival, which is often celebrated as integrated in on the site itself. And so when we look at uh, how an example of how we base a community in our management um, schemes of the site is that we have locally sourced out firefighting training to um, sort of as a climate action towards uh, forest fires, which is an increasing threat to the site being of high endemism. And so this not only builds capacity throughout the protected areas of Pale Island, but it also improves our emergency response communication. And another example of our strategies that we use throughout culture conservation is through educational outreach, whereby we do information sharing of the climate impacts directly through the site by giving them examples, um, eye to eye examples straight on, on how um, climate change is affecting our unique species. And so we do that by involving youth into our educational outreach programs um, by giving them hands-on experiences such as night safaris and uh, other activities uh, like holiday camps, whereby you know also the traditional knowledge is passed on to our younger generation. So our visitor statistics is one of the main, um, improving visitor statistics is one of our main objectives in this project of sustainable tourism uh, management, whereby there will be more information sharing of visit baseline visitor statistics to enhance risk management. Because as we see, we always seek to improve the relationship between biodiversity and the tourism industry on the site. And so, for example, in managing um, our peak visitor, visitor flows, we are able to manage our bi biodiversity also. And we also contribute to the statistical provision for climate action on a national level also. So this in, um, in hand increases our response plans for climate crises. So in, to sum up, uh, our project outcomes is to create adaptive measures to uh, reduce the impacts of tourism in, in activities that ac accelerates the effects of climate change. And while also basing our strategies community-wise, um, such as sourcing our trainees and trainers locally, um, to for climate action and risk mitigation. And so Valley de May ser serves as a huge platform to integrate such measures while also um, merging community and visitors as a uh, strategy. So thank you for listening and please don't hesitate to vi visit our website uh, www.sif.sc or please don't hesitate to contact me personally um, my email I will also put it in the chat and thank you thank you
thank you so from uh, thank you Cheyenne for that uh, great presentation and now uh, I would like to invite uh, Maureen Mokera Kombo from Kenya Marine and Fisheries Research Institute to uh, uh, give us a talk on uh, community-based solid waste management in preserving Lamu's heritage. Over to uh, Maureen. Oh, you're muted, Ms. Maureen. Muted, Maureen. Sorry. Just unmute your mic. Thank you. And you can also sorry, sorry about that. Uh, no, no problem. And you can also hit play on your PowerPoint. You can just play, you know, hit the play button on PowerPoint. You just yeah, thank you. Uh, I'll be presenting to you a project on integrating community-based solid waste management in preserving Lamus heritage. Uh, I work at the Kenya Marine and Fisheries Research Institute, where one of our mandates is to conduct research in freshwater and marine environments and advise on their wise and sustainable use. Um, Lamu is an oldest and best preserved soil settlement in East Africa, and it is located at the Kenya North Coast with a population of around 25,000 people, and it was accorded a UNESCO heritage site status in 2001. What we actually see on the, on the internet is actually the best good side of the coin where Lamu Old Town is regarded as a tourism uh, site where it creates employment and it's good aesthetic value. But in reality, we are not shown this bad side where we have litter uh, on the beach and uh, which results in loss of employment and cultural values of the of the old town. As you can see, the beach is very dirty with the gray water, solid waste. So this is actually the reality. Our project, uh, how marine links with the climate change, 2% of greenhouse gases is from the waste sector, which uh, source from open burning, open dumps and transport uh, through sometimes decomposition and photodegradation in the environment. Our objective for our project was to restore Lamu's heritage status through creating awareness on marine litter and the cleanup in Lamu Old Town beaches. Our approach, we first held interviews where we interviewed opinion youth and uh, opinion leaders and youth on their protection and promotion of Lamu heritage, their memories of Lamu Old Town as a heritage site and their perception on the value of conserving the environment. Also, we held a training on what is, and we covered what is marine litter and their impacts on, on the status of, of the town as a heritage site, fisheries, economy, and the environment, and how as the youth can, can do to reduce waste pollution. Lastly, we held an extensive beach cleanups on Lamu Old Town beaches. What we found uh, after the interview, especially with the opinion leaders, so for example, we in interviewed the Lamu National Museum cur curator, uh, the Lamu Youth Alliance chairman who deals with the environmental issues, the county director of environment, and uh, the Lamu Beach Management Unit chairperson, without forgetting the county public health chairman department. One thing that stood out was that there was actually a problem in solid waste management and the challenges include uh, the no motivation and sometimes there's, the, there's need to create awareness on the impacts of marine litter and sometimes failure to collect garbage is affecting the tour, tourism business in the island because of littering. Mm. Out of our interview, we had 82% uh, of them were, were males, with uh, 18 being females. More than half of them were natives in the island, while 35% just settled there. And we had a diverse representative of youth from ranging from entrepreneurs, fishers, arts and theater, mm, and uh, other youth. One thing that stood out is that Lamu Old Town is that it is 
tourism is highest of significance to the town with preservation of culture being second and uh, most reg regarded uh, the island as an income generating through trade. 59% mm. uh, acknowledge that inadequate service of especially waste collection was a challenge and lack of quality service. Sometimes uh, almost half of them acknowledge that lack of trained personnel was also a challenge in identify in solving with solid waste management. 88% mm. of youth consider plastic as a major source of, waste, of litter in the beaches with 65% from fishing gear. And uh, solid waste is a concern because it affects the environment as well as health of uh, individuals and also their animals. We also, on our trainings, after the training, the discussion revealed that number one, disposal systems are inefficient and sometimes lacking, especially at the seafront. There are no bins, even in residential areas. There are also illegal dumping stations that are rooting up, including old and unfinished houses. And also, the ocean is the most preferred dump site. This is because they believe the ocean cleans itself. So as they dump the waste in the ocean, the ocean during high tide will take the waste away. So they prefer the ocean as the dump site. Number two, oh, that's something that stood out was poor planning, especially on the legal dump site that is allocated. It is small and serves the whole island. And also it's very far from, from the people. So transferring is costly to the, to the dump site. And the municipal cleaning is only a, done once per day and only at the seafront, meaning residential places are left and camped. Mm, also, the attitude of the people was, your waste, your responsibility. So if I dump my waste anywhere, it's my responsibility to, to take it from there. No one else can step up and uh, do the cleaning. Also, they were aware on the impact of poor solid waste management evidence in the environment. And also they acknowledge that sometimes, uh, especially the fishing gear when they are in the sea, sometimes they're entangled on the boat propellers, uh, causing a navigating problem. Sometimes uh, the donkeys might, might eat some of the plastic and that is being littered around. And sometimes even on health, it, uh, some of them reported their, their skin due to the ocean being polluted when they swim, they get some skin rashes. And lastly, one of our activities, we did an extensive beach cleanup where we cleaned uh, two beaches that were located just next to it, two illegal dump sites. And it was done for two days. Um, from the cleanups, we were able to get to collect 97 bags of waste, which translates to around two tons of waste. As you can see there was a lot of litter. Mm. This is the picture on, on your left of the screen. You see the, the, the picture before the cleanup and on the right is after the cleanup. Uh, the same before versus after. Uh, the, the, this is an illegal dump site just next to the, to the beach. Mm. Recommendations, we recommend that more awareness on waste management is needed because as some of the youth were not even aware, how is it a problem if we dump the waste on the ocean because they believe the ocean cleans itself. Uh, and also towards the Lamo County municipality should provide bins in the streets and around residential areas. There are actually no bins. If you're a guest and you happen to go to Lamu, you'll have to work with your litter if you're conscious about the environment. If not, you'll just litter it. And then rest and collection and pickup should be frequent and there should be policies put in place to address waste management. And also there's a gap for recyclable waste. For example, provision of such platforms and markets through circular economy could promote and reduce plastic pollution. And more training is required for the county cleanup employees. So we witnessed one of the employees actually sweeping the seafront and the next station where she dumped the waste of the ocean. So training is also required for the cleanup for the training. And lastly, future collaboration should be considered among so many collaborators so that you can also fight this mm, problem. Lastly, I'd like to acknowledge and thank the UNESCO for UNESCO for their funding the Chemfree team for uh, being able to carry out this project, Lamu County government, 
National and Environmental Management Authority of Kenya, and lastly, the Lamu Youth Alliance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen, for sharing this important initiative. And now I would like to, um, I'm sure these inspiring projects have uh, also, you know, um, sparked something in the audience. And uh, the, I am now I would like to invite questions from the audience. And the aim is to uh, understand how we can make these uh, actions, which are very inspiring, uh, uh, wider practice. So with that intent, I would like to invite questions from the audience if there are any. Are there? I don't see any hands going up. You can also put them in the chat. There's a hand up from Mr. Tatenda. Okay, Mr. Tatenda, please unmute yourself and pose your question. Thank you very much. Um for the presentation uh, to the presenter who has just presented. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. From um, myself here, I think I've learned a lot. And again, um, I have uh, a number of questions, you know, running around my head. Um, you are allowed to ask one question. Yes. That's in there. One question. <laughs> Okay, so uh, my, my question will go to the level of commitment uh, within uh, the society of Lamu. How is the level of commitment in as far as uh, ensuring that they have got, you know, clean environments, cleaner um, tourism uh, destination center? How is the level of commitment like to the community? Uh, okay, well, to to address that, uh, for the, at the community level themselves, they they actually trying to they acknowledge that actually solid waste management is a problem. So to them, they actually try to do you know like they volunteer themselves to clean the beach on their own. But when it comes to the relevant authorities to keep track, let's say especially frequent collection of, of waste, provision of dustbin, it is not there. But the community itself is trying to, to keep the island clean through, you know, beach cleaner, uh, encouraging other people not to throw waste. Because one thing, according to their Swahili culture in the beginning, there were no designated places to do something. So when you try introducing a dustbin, it, it is not to their norm but some of them are actually trying to educate other community members that it is okay to designate this place just to dump waste. I know it is not in our culture, but it is okay to designate this place to do waste. So at the community level, they're actually trying. So it's only like that there's a broken leakage between the relevant authorities to address the solid waste problem with the community. I hope I've answered you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other reflections, questions, comments? Sure, I can go. This is Samia. Hi, Aparna. How are you? And hello, everyone. I see a lot of friends um, are joining here. So I think to address the question of scaling up um, uh, localized efforts of connecting climate culture, and I would actually add species. We, we can't just think about human beings. We have to bring in other species as well into the game for biodiversity. So I think to scale up these um, efforts, the primary um, foundational issue is education. Education that crosses disciplines and connects different um, disciplines and different cultures and different classes around a place. So the education needs to start becoming place-based rather than theoretical, abstract, and technical skills-based. So the main, and that's where Ikram comes in, place-based education that brings diverse disciplines, cultures, and classes to create place knowledge around the intersections of cultural heritage and climate and species uh, survival. 
um, it's an educational issue. From my, I mean, again, I might be looking at it from a very myopically. I'm an educator, so I always see you look for what you're looking for, right? You you find what you're looking for. So it is this could be a classic case of my myopic vision, but to me, it is central to create and generate place-based knowledge that transcends disciplines, class, and culture. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, valuable insight. I will take one more question. And I saw Daniel in our, in our case go, hand going up. Daniel, would you like to unmute yourself and ask the question? Um, oh, Apana, thank you so much. But um, I think that um, we will not now. OK, thank you. Maybe later. <laughs> okay. Okay. I, I also see other questions in the chat, but this is all we had time for. Uh, I just didn't want to, this was a very rich panel. Uh, and I want to thank all the speakers who uh, shared uh, very inspiring actions, but hold the thought. More lively discussion is uh, it's coming up, but uh, we have to move on also. And uh, Advancing this discussion further, I would like to invite some reflections and outcomes from the Youth Forum, uh, which was a very big part of this conference. Uh, many uh, you, uh, young leaders uh, and uh, professionals, and um, I would say experienced professionals also took part in this uh, Youth Forum. And there was an intergenerational dialogue and to uh, give us that insights of the, you know, and uh, some insights from this forum, this activity. I invite Mr. Ripal Konji, Kanji, who was the moderator. Uh, so over to Ripal. Ripal, would you like to share your... Uh... Is Ripal here with us? Um, unfortunately, I think he may have some connection issues. Maybe we can go to the next segment and uh, return back to him. Yes. Yes, yes, I understand. And it could be. Uh, so um, actually, um, I think it's a very good segue of what um, Saima was saying uh, about uh, multi-species justice. And uh, we would like to share a highlight from the conference. Uh, it's a film by Dr. Anne Paulina. Uh, I, I hope I pronounce her name well, Paulina. Uh, from uh, Western Australia, who's an active community leader and human and earth rights advocate. Uh, she participated in the, uh, in the uh, Ignite Pacific uh, panel, which uh, was conducted to accommodate the timings in the Asia Pacific region. And uh, the, she has shared a film which is very powerful and speaks for itself. So I would like to uh, invite all of you to watch this video with us. And um, can we just have the video? Thank you. Najanu Nilawa Malika, Nyayo Yimmaro Aramanin. My name is Malika, and I'm a woman who belongs to the Fitzroy River. This is a river where my mother's people grew up, the Nyigana people. One thing I've learned from leaving my country is that there seems to be a misunderstanding in regards to Aboriginal law. Some people call it folklore, other people call it dreamtime stories. But what these are really doing is communicating to the next generation the science, law and values of our people. Up in the hill country, there's a story of Dungaba, which actually represents the fact that there is gas underneath the earth. Over towards Yaru country, there's a story of a one-eyed snake who is actually mutated by uranium. These stories have so much more value to our people than to be classified as folklore. And I really wish that more people understood that there is an error in translation. In first law, everybody is given a jutting. A jutting is a totem, which teaches you to care about things beyond what is simply human. My jutting is the crocodile. So I have a relationship with them. I have respect for them. And I have a duty of care to protect them. Different people are given different animals or plants. This deep and harmonious relationship shows that there's got to be a balance in society. 
a removal of the hierarchy, and it teaches you as a young person that you are equal to and share respect with a non-human being. It creates accountability, compassion, responsibility, and it is a lifelong project. Jaida Buro Nigina, welcome to Nigina Country. Ngajinu Nilawala and Polina, Ngayo Imadawara Manin, Ngayo Mandajara Nigina, Ngay Nigina Nanga. And what I'm saying is, welcome to Nigina Country. My name is Anne Polina, and in my language, I said that I am a woman who belongs to the Fitzroy River, the Madawara. So from a property rights perspective, the river owns me, and I am duty bound to protect the river for the rest of its life. One of the words that we have in our language is a word called Bugaragara. Now Bugaragara means the past, the present, and the future, fused into this moment in time in which we as human beings need to be able to respond and react in the protection of country. So Bugaragara is a very, very important word and it places us as being traditional owners, indigenous people who have been here from the beginning of time. And so we have a due diligence to learn from the old stories, to take those stories as first law stories and to be able to understand that those stories teach us about values, about ethics, about code of conduct, about how to live in a civil society. One of the things that we say as Indigenous people is that we come from a world of we, not me. And so it's very, very important when we're looking at developing strategies to look at the collective well-being of not just Indigenous people, but our fellow Australians and indeed our global citizens. It is time for Australia and the world to recognise that we are the oldest living culture in the world that we hold ancient wisdom and stories that we really need to be bringing into looking at how we deal with complexity. So it's time for all of us to wake up, to feel the country, to hear country, and to know that we must co-design the strategies going forward in regards to climate change. These are really critical in terms of the planetary health, but also the health of our nation. And what we're saying is that the knowledge, the wisdom, the love, the ethics of care that are coming as a gift from indigenous people is a gift that is showing that together we must walk hand in hand if we are going to right size the planet and bring all of us into a world that can stop climate change from turning into climate chaos. Thank you. <clears throat> we come from the world of we, uh, not me. With those powerful words, we really thank Dr. Anne Paulina for making, uh, allowing us to share this film with all of you. And uh, I think uh, by now, uh, Ripoll has joined us. And uh, let's hear how the youth uh, leaders and uh, young professionals think about uh, becoming global citizens and uh, tackling the climate crisis, as well as using culture and heritage for global climate action. Over to Ripoll. Um, thank you so much. I would just want to make sure that my uh, screen is visible to everyone and uh, I'm yes. audible. Perfect. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, good evening, everyone. I'm indeed grateful for being given this opportunity to present the reflections from the Youth Forum of Climate Culture Peace. I'm sure that some of you might not have been able to attend our sessions. So for those, let me run you through what happened in our sessions really, really quick. Can we skip to the good part?
it was an amazing and enriching experience for all of us who attended. Coming back to the task at hand, have you noticed the title of the conference, Climate Culture Peace? How strategically culture is at the core of everything? So let us reflect on how the youth and young professionals perceive this in its entirety. The understanding of culture has grown and is growing beyond the boxed interpretation of tangible and intangible. We recognize that culture is polychromatic, different shades due to difference in perspectives and these perspectives are shaped by multiple factors and therefore culture is not stagnant, it is evolving. Culture is not merely traditional practices, indigenous knowledge, it is also something which is being freshly brewed on the go, manifested at, as customs, habits, attitudes, while we remain intrigued by questions like who or what defines our culture and how cultures are shaped, we must humbly acknowledge the fact that the process of brewing culture is multimodal and multi-parametric. One may be complacent enough to tag this evolving nature as erosion, but is it so? The very instinct of humankind is to develop and grow. We surely need to look back and learn, but also weigh such knowledge rationally, logically, scientifically, and wed those with advancements and innovations of the time. We often boast of our indigenous architectural practices saying that they are resilient, but do they satisfy the needs of the time? Thus, a fine balance of the past and present is necessary to ensure a resilient future. This brings us to two questions. Who can ensure this fine balance? Who amongst us have this incredible temperament of disrupting the status quo? Thinking out of the box and more importantly, for whom are we envisaging this resilient future? Unanimously, the youth and the young professionals of today. They are burdened with the responsibility of bringing these two worlds together. It's just not the sectors or disciplines that we need to talk about. These are two worlds that we need to bring together. For example, let's talk about climate change. The science behind is known to some of us and for others, the shared socioeconomic pathways from the IPCC report is an alien language. On the other hand, the communities, be it a nation like Tuvalu or a community from the highlands of the Himalayan state of Uttarakhand in India, it's not the science that is felt, it's the effects and impacts. While we have mathematical and analytical models to help us in assessing risks, we have been able, ha, have we been able to factor in the perception of these communities? Do we have a model at hand which can account for the ambiguity and plurality of human perceptions? Let's look at another example. Climate change induced sea level rise is a pertinent threat and that is well understood by some of us, but it's systemic effects and impacts on communities and culture. Have we been able to understand those? This is where transdisciplinarity is required. A climate scientist, a heritage professional, a social scientist need to come together with the mindset of crossing over to each other's discipline to be able to understand the social needs, the political fabric and co-create a plausible solution with the community. This is again where the youth and young professionals are required to use their superpower. We are the ones who are known to be tech savvy, we are the ones who are worried about our culture and that is why we all are here. We are the ones spending hours on making and watching Instagram reels and TikTok. Then why not merge all of this together? We need to bring the science based on facts and evidence, wrap it in a palatable narrative and present it in a way which drives us to action. If we are to accept that culture is the way of life without the divisive intonations, then we must agree that our ways of life have grandly laid us here where we are now in a volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous world. Thus, it is clear that we need an alternative path, a path which builds a culture of resilience, resilience to hazards, resilience to the climate emergency, resilience to conflicts. The youth and young professionals need to take up the responsibility of strategizing this path. After all, we need to do this for ourselves, by ourselves. We agree that we have been trying and we will keep on trying, but at times we do feel disheartened because the ecosystem is not conducive or receptive of our ideas, but that should not discourage us. We must keep swimming because we are doing this for us. 
With the climate crisis at hand, intensified disaster risks, conflicts, we are perhaps at the lowest or maybe even heading towards it. But we must understand that we fall so that we can learn to pick ourselves up. You may have noticed that many of our statements underscore the phrase that we need to do this, we need to do that. Well, let us put an end to it. Let us act now and pick ourselves up and turn this around. Let us pick ourselves up and act towards turning our vulnerabilities in all its dimensions into our capacities. If the world is still interested in the mad race of economic prosperity, we, the youth and young professionals vouch to bring in the sustainability of our civilization through science, technology, innovation, and of course, our cultures. This is our hopescape within the riskscape that we live in. This is the culture that we want to build. I rest my case. Thank you. Thank you, Ripal. <clears throat> Thank you for reminding about us about the hope, hope that hopescape is within a riskscape and that uh, we have to take action and we have to take action now. And it has to be transdisciplinary and it has to be transformative. And to do that and to think about such an action, we have an expert panel coming up. But before that, a two minutes break. So let's have a two minutes, two minutes break and then we'll be back with our expert panel. Thank you. Welcome back. Now, uh, as I had said before, we have an expert panel uh, who will be helping us to uh, understand better what kind of actions we need to take and advance policy, practice, and research. Uh, to do that, uh, co-moderating with me will be Dr. Marcy Rockman who is an archeologist based in Washington, DC, and uh, has been working with the US National Park Service as their lead for uh, climate uh, change and cultural heritage. Uh, Dr. Rockman is also the scientific coordinator for Climate Culture Peace. So welcome, Marcy. Thank you so much, Aparna. And hello, everyone, honored to be here. Thanks, Marcy. And uh, also this, uh, in this part, we are, as uh, our uh, expert uh, panelists, uh, distinguished panelists who, are, who come from different fields, will be speaking and sharing their ideas with us. Uh, we will have a visual uh, facilitator in the background working to, uh, you know, uh, put their ideas in form of uh, you know, sketching their ideas in form of drawings and 
to do uh, to do that, I would like to introduce uh, Mr. Christopher Malabita. Christopher, would you like to just say hello to everyone? Hello, thank you. Looking forward to the discussion. Coming up soon. So without further ado, let's uh, just uh, meet with our panelists who have joined us from all corners of the world. First, I have the honor and pleasure to introduce Ms. Hindu Abrahim, who is president of Association for Indigenous Women and Peoples of Chad. But this is just one of the affiliations of Ms. Abrahim, who is a renowned community leader and a, a global voice. I welcome Ms. Abrahim. To start with, we would like you to introduce yourself and tell our um, uh, colleagues, attendees, speakers, uh, a little bit about yourself and your background and your work on uh, climate change, uh, disasters, and peace. Thank you very much. And hi, everyone. It's really a great pleasure to be with you. And I was very happy to listen to the previous panel about culture climate change and how the, it's affecting the cultural heritage. So my name is Hindu Umaru Ibrahim. I am an indigenous woman coming from a pastoral communities uh, living around the Sahel regions. So my peoples are across five countries, Chad, Cameroon, Niger, Nigeria, and Central African Republic. And my people are just cut by the colonialism where they put like Chad and Cameroon and all those countries and then just to divide my own peoples, my own family from my uncle, from my aunties, from my father's side and mother's side in different countries. But we all belong from the bigger land of the Sahel and still we are moving around this place. So uh, I work with my community and with all the other indigenous communities to see the way how I can combine the traditional knowledge and science knowledge how I can build a bridge between the reality on the ground and also the world that where they are taking the decision at the international level, like climate change conferences or biodiversity or desertification conferences. So that's what I'm doing. And my interest in this uh, discussion here, uh, when we talk about the climate change, we often forget about the, the uh, relation with culture, with identity. And for indigenous peoples, it is not about the nature only. It is about our identities. It is about our culture, where we are passing the traditional knowledge from one generation to another one. So then now uh, for us, it is also the way on how we are building alliances to keep the peace between the communities and the peace with, between the human being and the nature. So to stop here for my introduction, and I will be very happy to respond to all the questions about the, around the panels on the climate change, peace, and uh, uh, solutions. Thank you. Thank you so much for that great introduction. Uh, so I would like to ask you next uh, that there is, as you have yourself said, uh, acknowledged that there is a growing uncertainty, complexity, and we are living on, in dynamic conditions. But, and uh, we are also realizing that uh, the uh, you know, more formal methods of learning are not able to keep up. And we have to educate a diverse group of uh, groups of people, you know, both young and old about uh, climate change, but also about its links to culture, traditional knowledge. So my question to you is, what can we learn from indigenous and traditional ways of learning and how do we bring the traditional knowledge together with more formalized forms of knowledge? Can you give us some ideas about that? Absolutely. So firstly, it is very important to understand when we say indigenous peoples, we represent 5% of the world's populations and we protect 80% of the world's biodiversity. And when we say that it is not the report, it is the truth, the realities, because indigenous peoples live around all those different ecosystems and various ecosystems from grasses to the desert, to the oceans, to the savannas, to the tropical forest. We have indigenous peoples around all those places. And our way of living is depending from the nature. And the simple example is from my own communities. So I say we depend from the rainfall. 
We do not depend from the end of the month salaries. We depend from when the rent come correctly. We can get the grass growing up, our cattle can eat and we can get the milk. In the year that we have a flood or a drought that impact our own cattle, and then the consequences are we get less milk, we get less economy, food insecurity, and all the consequences. So that's also why when we are frontline of the climate change, we are also the solutions. The way that we are living in harmony with the nature, it's helped us to learn a lot from this nature. So how we can bring those traditional knowledge with the recognized science, or we can call it modern science. So what we used to say, our grandmothers and grandfathers have PhD++ in many fields of the environment protections. So I do a traditional knowledge method with the science knowledge through a designing of the participatory mapping. Let me explain to you quickly what is the participatory mapping. So uh, it is a way where you can do a 3D participatory model or a 2D. The 3D, you can do it only in the place where you can get a hill. And then you use the science knowledge from a layers of the uh, uh, geographical information. And from this geographical information, you build the layers and then you have the GPS as technology and you have the communities who can come and put all the knowledge over the map. At the end, you get a 3D model built by the communities. But a 2D model that I did just talk a month ago in December, in chat. So this one, you need also the science knowledge from the satellite images. So the last one I did, I, I map over 2000 kilometer squares of the land. And by using the satellite map, we combine all the communities that come together. It's not the communities that used to talk among themselves. There are farmers, there are fishermen and pastoralists, those who use the same resources, but also who have the conflict over those resources. So they come over hundred communities where they map all the water resources, all the agriculture place, the traditional forest, the sacred forest, the medicinal plants, etc. And when they put all those knowledges together over two weeks, at the end, you get a full map of the communities that didn't went to school, but who understand better the detail of their environment than a satellite map. At the end, we digitalize this map by taking a pictures. And after the digitalizations, now the work that I have to do to finalize it in the coming two weeks is to share those digitalized map with the communities and build a convention between them to how they can translate this traditional knowledge to the next generation, not only in oral as we use, but into the writing way. And this is very exceptional because it can help the, uh, the authorities, the local authorities to take the decisions by involving the communities and to write also a national law that can respect the nature and include all the form of communities and the traditional knowledge as it is into the Paris Agreement. Thank you. Thank you for sharing this very innovative in initiative. And uh, my last question before I move on to the next uh, speaker and, and introduce the next panelist is to uh, ask you that how, how can this be replicated around the world? What recommendations would you give to our audience and uh, everybody who's hearing you today? Absolutely, it is possible to replicate that. And that's why also I like this exercise. So the next step for me, I'm going to do that outside of Chad in, in Niger, uh, probably, but it can be also done into the islands, into a tropical forest around all the world. What we need to understand to replicate it, you cannot have the same map in all the places because as the ecosystem change, the map also get adapted to this ecosystem. But we need to combine the science knowledge from geographical information, the technology from the GPS to get the data and the traditional knowledge of the communities. In order to make it successful, you need the communities to get engaged, committed with a free prior and informed consent. You can't come and impose to them. They have to 
agree because at the end they are the one who will use the map for over centuries and centuries without you if they didn't agree or they didn't understand so your map cannot be successful at all and the last thing to do when you do the map it is not only to resolve one problem it can help to plan climate adaptation mitigation but also the development but also the peace building between the communities that are using the same resources but also the uh, 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 transfer of the knowledge to the next generation as the school so you can do it for a so different method and be sure to involve women because this is the most important part. The women have a detailed knowledge on those traditional way of building the participatory mapping. And you must involve them by respecting the culture and identity of the communities in order to have all the knowledge coming into the map. Otherwise, if you say, I wanted to have the women just because you wanted to have them, you can have, but not all the knowledge that can come by the respect on the culture. So this is really very important. Thank you. Thank you for those valuable insights. And as you said, uh, prior uh, free and informed consent of the communities is the key. And that brings me to uh, move on. Thank you so much. And we will come back to you with some more questions. And um, so that um, I would now like to move on to uh, Mr. Albino Jopela, who is uh, the head of programs for African World Heritage Fund. Welcome, Mr. Jopela. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today and making time for this panel. Um, uh, first, please uh, just introduce yourself uh, and uh, tell us more about your work, and then I'll, you know, uh, pose my first question to you. Yeah. Please introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, my name is Albino Jopela. I'm the head of programs at Africa World Heritage Fund, which is an intergovernmental organization launched by UNESCO and the Africa Union in 2006 with the mission to support the effective conservation and protection of natural and cultural heritage of outstanding universal value in Africa. And the fund uh, is a founding member of the Climate Heritage Network and a co-chair of the Network for Africa uh, in the Middle East. So the Climate Heritage Network is a global uh, network committed to mobilizing arts, culture, and heritage to address climate change and support communities in achieving the ambitions of the Paris Agreement through coordination, cooperation among its members. So I would like to also warmly greet uh, many of the CHN members attending this uh, event. And the members um, work with all types uh, of culture uh, and heritage, and those include um, government uh, at all levels, indigenous peoples organizations, civil society universities, cultural institutions, uh, artists, creative industries, uh, and other business. Uh, so what unites us is the common belief that arts, culture, and heritage constitute an invaluable resource to help communities reduce the, the greenhouse gas emissions and strengthen adapt adaptive cap capacity, a viewpoint well illustrated by many of the examples uh, we have heard uh, this week. So thank you uh, so much for including the CHN in this event and for inviting me to speak about valuing culture-based pathways for lasting peace, disaster risk reduction, climate action uh, for people and heritage. Thank you so much, Mr. Jopera. I think uh, we are honored to have the Climate Heritage Network as part of this conference. This is the uh, purpose that uh, the various networks should be connected. Uh, my first question is uh, that there is a wealth of knowledge that exists among communities as has been just uh, you know uh, highlighted by Ms. Ibrahim in different uh, you know Af African countries it's a vast continent and diverse cultures it is most but this wealth of knowledge which is community health is mostly under documented and under researched so in your opinion what role African World Heritage Fund could play in valorization and promoting the use of this knowledge for climate action. Could you just shed some light on that? Um, thank you. Um, I think uh, one can uh, anchor on um, a strategy which 
um, we have uh, been used at the fund, which basically um, uh, looks into strengthening capacity building, building partnership and raising awareness. Uh, and this cuts across um, a number of areas. And if I give you a, a little bit of a background and example, uh, this will make it uh, clear. Uh, so in general, uh, climate science has made it clear that uh, nothing short of rapid and far reaching uh, transitional to low carbon climate resilience future will allow us to avoid worse impacts of climate change. Uh, but to date, however, uh, the world remains dangerous, of course. Uh, so what has been missing from the climate planet? And one uh, answer is clear, is culture and heritage. So our potential remain largely unrealized. Um, and this is one of the things that must change. So this requires us to think differently. Uh, so we must take on board the imperatives of the climate emergency in culture and heritage practice, so that our pathways must acknowledge that climate action and sustainable development are in fact two sides of the same coin, and that both require attention to the cultural dimension of inequality, poverty, and also a just transaction. So we must also prioritize adapting to the changes in climate that humans have already caused and the understanding the vulnerability we face to both current and future climate impact from both rapid and slow onset events. So the Africa World Heritage Fund was proud to join forces with Climate Heritage Network members and African partners um, and stakeholders to increase local capacity to adapt to threats of climate change to cultural heritage by testing um, in a pilot phase a climate vulnerability index uh, methodology in two World Heritage sites uh, uh, in Africa. And here, just um, to highlight that those sites were already um, being managed uh, also partially through um, the knowledge from the local uh, communities. And I'm referring to the sites of uh, the Suku cultural landscape in Nigeria and um, the sites of Kilakiswan in Tanzania. Um, and this, uh, the CVI project uh, provided foundational training to African heritage professionals and addressed the gap that exists in understanding climate impact on cultural heritage in Africa, while at the same time creating a longer term capacity within African heritage communities. So projects like this that strengthen capacity building, build partnership and raise awareness, promote also solidarity among frontline communities, it, which is another way uh, and another key um, uh, area uh, and mission of both the Africa World Heritage Fund and the Climate Heritage uh, uh, members. So as we face um, those issues of climate in our daily life, we should also recognize uh, the fact that no site, no community or no discipline can address this climate change in a silo. And that's why um, the CHN has also been working to mainstream culture and heritage into uh, climate uh, policy uh, and science. So when we look into uh, traditional knowledge and uh, traditional systems, uh, one strategy that one um, can uh, have learned from, for instance, the management of world heritage sites uh, across uh, the continent, is that uh, um, a number of um, those sites were managed through that traditional knowledge that you have traditional custodians who then um, have always looked um, after uh, those sites. So now in climate action, one has to acknowledge that capacity building is not only um, implemented within one realm uh, of knowledge production, which is the scientific one, but that um, all um, knowledge um, is equal uh, in addressing the challenge um, of climate. So this is one uh, of the areas that would uh, approach. Uh, and, and of course, you would go into some uh, conventional methods such as uh, documentation uh, um, um, and record keeping. But those are not, let's say, the only ways because even the undocumented 
um, wrote knowledge in written form can also be orally transmitted. And the most important uh, aspect here is that it has to be acknowledged and recognized as equally valid uh, with other forms of knowledge. Thank you. Thank you for uh, uh, that very comprehensive answer. But um, I would like to just like uh, extend this a uh, little bit further and ask you uh, what connections do you see between the actions that the Africa World Heritage Fund is taking in capacity development and peace building? I mean, how is it helping to reduce uh, inequality or root causes for disasters and conflicts in the region? And uh, what connections you see? between your work and peace building. Thank you. So um, we have uh, Africa being what we consider the cradle uh, of humankind. So uh, it offers a wealth of uh, opportunities in terms of uh, how uh, the care, um, not only for, uh, for heritage, but also for the custodians of this heritage is basically at the core of uh, um, any, um, development that is being um, uh, sustainable. So when we look, for instance, within the work that we do at Africa World Heritage Fund, um, and we anchor these on the visions of global agenda, such as uh, the UN 2030, um, as well as the Africa Union Agenda 2063. Um, so the, the, the care and the sustainable uh, conservation and management of world heritage not only looks into addressing uh, some of the root uh, problems in the continent, uh, such as uh, conflict, but also um, building uh, the, the message of uh, intercultural uh, dialogue. So we will find that in many, um, in a number of significant uh, sites, the management and conservation mechanism, for instance, in terms of transboundary uh, um, uh, sites, but also through the way the, the World Heritage Convention uh, is implemented as a whole, offer um, in numerous opportunities uh, for building uh, peace and addressing um, um, other issues. And for instance, when I refer to the uh, CVI project uh, where we, uh, we bring um, professionals uh, who are in charge of managing heritage to better understand the impact of climate change uh, uh, on this world heritage. That also on its own provides a window through which uh, one can not only expand the application of this methodology throughout um, the continent, but most importantly, to also uh, um, uh, contributes to the knowledge um, that I uh, hope builds our understanding about uh, uh, this, um, uh, the, the impact of climate change, which at the moment still remain one of the huge gaps um, in terms of effective uh, conservation and management of world uh, heritage. So it's all tie on not only in terms of uh, um, how do we strengthen our ability uh, to uh, safeguard uh, the heritage, but also uh, how do we actually increase our ways, uh, our knowledge and the way of understanding the challenges we face uh, today and also how such challenge will, uh, will shape our futures. Thank you. Um, I would have liked to ask you one more question, but uh, the time is up. And uh, that, um, with that, I would like to move on and um, introduce uh, our next panelist, uh, Dr. Zaki Aslan, who is the director of uh, Sharjah um, Regional Center of Ikra. And uh, welcome, Dr. Zaki. Um, nice to see you, Aparna, and I'm so happy to see many friends also on the panel. Thank you for joining us. Um, Zaki, would you like to uh, just briefly explain a little bit about your work and so that then I, can, I will, uh, you know, um, uh, ask you the first question. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm Zaki Aslan. I'm the director of the regional um, center for uh, Ikram uh, here based in Sharjah in the United Arab Emirates. And uh, I've been working at Ikram since 2003 
on a program for the Arab region called Athar, um, uh, which addressed uh, have addressed to date actually issues that are uh, related to cultural heritage, uh, particularly the archaeological and ar architectural heritage in the Arab region. Um, we have been working um, uh, within the framework of Ikram uh, strategies, but also the needs, the particular needs of the region for the past uh, 19 years. So uh, the, uh, the office was established in 2012, and uh, then I moved from Rome, and we started operation from, uh, from where I am now in the United Arab Emirates to address also the challenges that the region have been facing in the past few years, especially related to conflicts, as you all know. And, um, and we've also addressed all the aspects that ICROM does, ranging from capacity building uh, of professionals, but also looking into outreach activities. Uh, we have uh, an award program, a forum program. We have also uh, activities related to dissemination of uh, information through publications. And we have some field projects, in fact, that uh, have informed us a lot in the context of this particular seminar. The latest project that we had in Sudan, the uh, Western Sudan Community Museums also uh, continued in that direction, in fact, addressing issues related to climate and conflict. Uh, I will talk probably about this in a moment. And then um, we have also been um, uh, uh, convening thematic activities and think tanks to inform also policies uh, that are in need, uh, in, 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 in great need for the region. So this is in a nutshell about what we do here at Ikram Sharjah. Thank you. And Thank, so you Zaki. Thank you for uh, introducing your work a little bit. And uh, the question that I would like to ask you is, uh, what are the key challenges that you see to the safeguard of heritage from the impacts of climate change in the Arab region? And you were also part of the uh, the MENA region and uh, the Arab region uh, panel that we uh, that was organized as part of this conference. So you are also bringing some insights from that panel. So I would like you to share those with our um, um, attendees today. And uh, following that, uh, I uh, please also try to identify pathways that you see uh, for uh, using culture and heritage. Uh, to develop disaster risk reduction, climate action, and sustainable right. building. Yeah. Thank you, Aparna. Let me thank you actually for this opportunity because, in fact, the panel that we had was an eye opener. I have to say, to um, to link, you know, the themes that uh, uh, are addressed during this uh, seminar, and um, in particular, actually, we looked at uh, the Arab region, and we're starting from the climate perspective. Uh, as you all know, this is 90% um, uh, uh, of the land of the Arab region, talking about uh, Morocco to the Gulf, is actually arid or semi-arid climate. Um, uh, so that imposed a lot of uh, issues, especially related to water-stressed countries here in the region. If I look at some of the statistics that uh, actually are very alarming in this particular region, I can share some of uh, with you, like um, 14 of the 20 countries in the Arab region are most water stressed countries and 6% uh, of the uh, annual internal water resources compared to the average annual precipitation um, uh, are only 6%, so compared to an average of 38% in uh, other parts of the world. Um, I want also to share with you some statistics because actually this will give you a sense of the um, uh, necessity to see how we can address all these in the context of, uh, of the theme of the conference. Um, we at 15% of the current uh, climate change projections show that the, uh, uh, by the year 2025, the water supply in the Arab region will only be 15% uh, of the level of 1960, which is very, very, I mean, I mean, the statistics go on, on and on, but I, I wanted to highlight some of these um, related uh, to desert desertification, uh, related to deforestation, but also uh, droughts, which are uh, uh, at the increase, and I, I, I believe with this, with these stresses, um, there is uh, a need to look into uh, the, um, the cultural perspective also as to how we deal with, uh, with all these stresses in, in, in heritage places, in particular in the region. 
as you all know, also the Arab region uh, has various complications, the impact of uh, not only the impact of climate change, but also the political instability, the economic vulnerability. It became the largest exporter of uh, human immigration and consequently humans migrate looking for better lives internally in the same country or outside the country, leading to a more pressure on natural resources, uh, services and the land. Um, so all that actually drew the attention for us that all these challenges increase the conflict also over natural resources, the land and the water, and therefore uh, intervention efforts shall be directed to minimize or should be directed to minimize such conflicts uh, stemming from such um, uh, problems uh, related to climate. Um, I mentioned some of our projects that we have been dealing with uh, uh, that are in conflict zones uh, related to uh, all these, uh, you know, aspects that we discussed. So maybe I can talk about this uh, in a moment. But um, I think uh, what was important uh, to know here also from the region is that uh, the importance of traditional knowledge um, came to the fore in the, in the practices that um, uh, we looked at, for example, there are systems that uh, existed more than 1500 years ago. Uh, for example, there is a system of Hema where you have you know, how uh, people and the communities share resources. There are systems that we can learn from archeology span like in the site of Petra, how the Nabataeans use the water harvesting. There are many, many other examples like the Falaj system, for example, which is listed on World Heritage, how the uh, the sharing of, um, of the resources are being managed uh, in local traditional management uh, systems. So I think there are many things that uh, we could learn from, from all these uh, things. And uh, the challenge for us is now, um, although there are some initiatives you know, to, to address all these issues, but um, I still feel like uh, there should be also a lot of um, uh, support, perhaps uh, from, uh, well, of course, we talk about education as well, but I'm, I'm also trying to, to put this in the context of the world context as well, how support is much needed to address these issues in this acute, you know, uh, environment in, in this uh, part of the world. Uh, so we need professional, technical, we need also, we have to look at the innovative approaches combined with the traditional ones, um, looking back at uh, awareness uh, of communities, involvement of communities, and these all came to the fore in the discussions that we had uh, during the, uh, the panel. So the community aspect is very, very important. You mentioned the youth now. Uh, there was a, a huge uh, or a major emphasis also on women and their participation in traditional systems in places like Sudan, for example. Um, and uh, many learnings that we could learn from, from you know, these, uh, these practices that can help us uh, develop future strategies for this particular region. Thank you. Thank you, Zaki. Thank you for those uh, sharing these um, outcomes and insights. Um, I, this brings me to, um, you know, to just um, as a, to connect uh, what uh, Ms. Ibrahim was saying earlier about respecting, uh, you know, involving women in climate action. And you were also saying that that came out strongly in the panel. Just a, a bit of information I would like to share is that in this conference, the, um, uh, 1400, over 1400 participants registered and 61% are women. So that's a heartening sign. And uh, I hope that you will also invite uh, Ms. Ibrahim or also connect with Mr. Jopela for perhaps thinking of a trans-regional um, action. And, That's uh, right. In fact, that was also mentioned during the panel, uh, trans-regional collaboration, especially with, uh, with Africa. Especially with Africa. So thank you. Thank you so much, um, Zaki, for those insights. We will come back to you with some more questions. But uh, at this point, I would like to introduce, uh, bring back uh, Dr. Marcy Rockman, who will now uh, take on the next part of this panel. Over to you, Marcy.
Great. Thank you so much, Aparna. And my deep thanks to everyone who's been presenting already in this closing session um, and the panelists who are yet to come. Um, all of the material has been so engaging. Um, so I think we're going to pull together uh, some more. To the panel uh, that is coming up, I just wanted to share with you um, sort of a spark that has come to me in going through all of the conference this week. And it's a, a quote or saying from 19th century naturalist, John Weir. And he said, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. And as I've seen all the discussions uh, throughout this week, it seems that how we think about and talk and work with culture and heritage just illustrates this to such a high degree that all of how we know stories and landscape and places and remember them and, and share them forward are all deeply connected. But one of the challenges that we're facing throughout this conference is when we look at the connections between what the world is recognizing as climate change and culture and heritage, we need to be asking, are these hitched or are they connected in the ways we most want them to be connected? Are there ways we should change how they are connected? Are there new links we need to forge? So I do have specific questions uh, for all of you, um, but I wanted to just share that idea of linking uh, for you and that that really infuses all of the questions I'll be asking. And then I was also really inspired by Rapal's presentation on the youth session. And I, been sitting here thinking like it's not just about linking but linking them in a way that we can send some energy through that link so that they are usable and really active and dynamic with all of that um i think we've got i get to talk with five of you um i am going to introduce each of you with your title and then what i want to do is just ask each of you to i'll give you a brief space as aparna was doing uh, with her speakers to add anything additional that you would like us to know about your experience. And then I'm going to ask you probably a very large, chunky question, um, and we'll break it down, but go through it as, as quickly and as energetically as we can. And I will do my best to link between all of the questions. So with that, we're going to turn to Dr. Diane Douglas. Diane, is your, um, could you turn on your video? We're not seeing. Uh, say something again. Um, and we're not. We're not seeing. Right you. here, it says my video is showing. Okay, it says my video is on. I'll stop it and start it again. There you are. Now we can see you. Okay. Perfect. Sorry, I so guess it went. <laughs> It went dim. <laughs> so we've got you. Um, our first, the first person with whom uh, I will be discussing is Dr. Diane Douglas, founder and director of the Initiative for Sustainable Development in Africa. So Diane, is there anything you would like to add to that? Because I know you have a really deep experience. I think you are on mute again. Yeah. Now you're back. Okay. Uh, in the middle of your presentation, so your introduction. You are very, very spotty. Um, yeah, I don't know what to do about that. Um, I have a hot spot. <laughs> okay, you've just clicked over to being unmuted. Just try saying something again. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Okay. Yeah, it, my thing shows as being unmuted, but I guess it doesn't mean what it shows. So, okay. Um, so just very quickly, would you tell us any additional um, of your background that you would like us to know? I think probably the most important part of my background is that I have a very kind of diverse background. So my my undergraduate degree is in cultural anthropology. My master's is in paleo environmental studies. So basically reconstructing climate going back, you know, 2.5 million years. And my doctorate is in climatology and biodiversity and how all of that affects humanity and humanity affects it. 
And through the course of that academic background, it's enabled me to look at things more holistically. And that's one of the most interesting things I found in many of the discussions today and, and earlier this week is the importance of linking nature and culture, that they're not inseparable. You can't you know, separate them and deal with them in a different way. And so over the past 30 years, I've primarily been working as an environmental and social consultant um, all over the world in about 20 different countries. And one of the things that I found in working on environmental social impact assessments and other things of that nature is that local and indigenous cultures are often ignored. They're not consulted with adequately. And although you know, the World Bank and international financial lender institutions have mechanisms for consulting with these groups and basically require it as part of the ESHA process, it's a checkbox approach as opposed to actually really consulting with them. So one of the things that um, I founded the uh, Initiative for Sustainable Development in Africa in 2020. And one of the things that we're trying to do is to actually go into African communities, talk to practitioners of, of Isha's who actually do the work on the ground in Africa. And so we're gonna be going starting in Eastern Africa and then going to Southern Africa and then Western Africa and then Northern and Central. It's about a 12 year plan, but talking to the people on the ground and having them identify the resources, natural and cultural resources that are important to them. And I loved um, you know, the earlier presentation on the GIS mapping of heritage resources that are important. I mean, one of the primary things in Africa is the colonialism cut up the, you know, the continent into these false countries, divided up ethnic groups and separated families and separated traditional landscapes is to try and create a way of mapping natural and cultural resources that transcend boundaries in terms of geographic boundaries, as well as political boundaries and so on, engaging women and the youth um, all the way through, but making it so that governments and international lender institutions and project proponents start talking to these groups 20 to 30 years out. So involve them in the general plan of the country. So basically, what is this country gonna look like 20, 30 years from now, so that they're part of the vision. And with that, be able to map out what resources are important to them, provide pathways in terms of like biodiversity conservation areas that also protect their natural heritage, their cultural heritage, um, and allow these groups to manage their own resources, both cultural and, and natural. And that creates jobs and also gives them um, a point of living, you know, so where they don't have to flee. I mean, out migration is a huge problem in Africa where you have the environmental degradation from poor planning and climate change, and then resulting in out migration, not only within the country, but to Europe and so on. So trying to find the root causes and uh, minimize them. And now I'll be quiet, so. Thank you. That was such a, a great, um thick introduction. And actually, I think you've just set up the, the big question that I wanted to ask you directly. And that's the about the articulation between climate science and culture and heritage. And I think the way I've been phrasing the question is, I am really curious if from your work, if you're aware of questions about human behavior or society that climate science is seeing, what are some of those questions? And then the capacity of culture and heritage to answer them. And just how do we bring, ultimately, how do we bring climate science and culture and heritage into a closer dialogue with each other and understanding and hearing each other's questions? I think one of the key things that I found, and this goes back to uh, one of the earlier presentations, is that we all sit and tend to sit around a room and talk to each other. And we all know what the issues are and we just spin them again and again and again and again over year after year after year. And so getting out and engaging with a diverser, you know, greater diversity of people. So having the cultural heritage scientists talk to the natural scientists. And I found it over the past several years, I've started kind of working with IUCN and IPBS because they do a really beautiful job of integrating culture and nature and talking to indigenous groups and invite, you know, involving them in uh, what is this landscape gonna look like? 
And so I think for cultural heritage specialists who get really frustrated that, oh, nobody listens to me, um, you need to make it relevant. You need to basically bring back the point that maintaining cultural heritage is very important. And cultural heritage and natural heritage are intrinsically linked throughout most of the world. And you, you, know, you have to maintain both. You have to conserve nature and culture. And by doing so, you will reduce stress on the environment. You'll well, help protect the environment, um, reduce climate change, but also reduce financial and social stress. You'll have greater peace, less conflict, less out migration. So if you bring it back to people who are, you know, just regular Joe as a phrase that we use often in the United States and Canada, um, link it to finances that basically by protecting cultural heritage, you increase, increase the financial well-being of the world. You reduce the gap between the, the richest and the poorest and provide opportunities for those who are currently struggling for survival on a day-to-day -day basis to actually share their vision of what the future should look like and tap into their ingenuity and so on. So it, it's basically, we have to stop just talking to each other, talk to the rest of the world and, and, and engage the youth because they do have the energy and they know how to get um, the message out there. Um, and I think you have another question coming up that will help me direct the rest of my answer, so. I think it was that, you just touched on it. It was what are those approaches that we need to bring them into closer dialogue? So you you've grabbed it. I think um, I think the, the the coronavirus has been a good example of how little people want to listen to government and scientists. So if we could engage we the scientists and the climate modelers and so on, have important jobs to do, but unless we can reach out to to people and get them to respond and stop buying plastics and start planting trees and stop you know, degrading the environment, um, all we're gonna do is keep talking to each other. And it's interesting, there's been a lot of studies on transformation and how do you get people to change the way their behavior. And one of the key things that has come out of many of those studies is tapping into culture and arts. So getting to the, you know, the musicians and the actors and the performers that people love and worship because if you can get them to speak out you know um, like Leonardo DiCaprio talking about climate change and I think that those people reach far broader audience and get it into children's books and you know expand the education rather than having all of us sitting around in a white box and talking to each other is engage the artists and the athletes and the performers and the people that you know the general public listen to all over the world. So each country it's going to be different. Um, but yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Diane. I wish we could talk about that more and more. Um, but I need to move on to the next panelist. But I want to pull some threads from your piece um, over to um, Abiyant Tawari, who is our next panelist. Hey, hi, Mercy. Thank you so much. So I hope you can hear me. Oh, I can. You are loud and clear. So I okay. get to introduce you as Dr. Aviant Tawari, assistant, assistant professor at the Gujarat Institute of Disaster Management in India. Uh, and I wanted to ask, is there anything you would like to add to that introduction that you would like us to know about your work and your background? Yeah, sure. So I am, you rightly introduced, I'm Abhyan Tiwari. I work as an assistant professor at Gujarat Institute of Disaster Management. And if I introduce myself uh, with my colleague who just presented his work of, on Youth Forum, Ripal. So me and Ripal, we both work together and kudos to Ripal and, uh, you know, Apan and the entire CCP team from uh, this entire, you know, uh, conference, the virtual conference that we were very fascinating about and very excited about and I'm, I'm really happy that we are uh, we have successfully almost completed this uh, this entire conference and particularly the youth forum so congratulations again and uh, yes i i work um, uh, in, in in the disaster field for last 2 years now but before that i have background in public health and so i have you know uh, 
I should say I have a mixed background. I have worked on public health. I have worked on environmental health sciences. And in that way, I have connected, uh, you know, worked closely with the climate, you know, science people as well, uh, or, or worked on the issues of climate change and health. And then moved to the, the field of disaster risk management or disaster risk reduction is what we call now. So uh, something that I find, you know, whenever I move around these field, uh, moved around these fields is that uh, there are some interlinkages in the, all these fields, right? Uh, you can't address one issue without, you know, working on the other issue. And, and, and formally, this is my first, you know, uh, a brief or detailed, uh, you know, exposure or experience with the, uh, with the people working on culture and heritage. But then I also realized, and I can interlink the work that I've been doing uh, on, on my public health um, or environmental health background, which is largely on the heat wave adaptation plans uh, in, in, in cities. So I've been working, I've been instrumental uh, uh, in, in developing the heat health adaptation plans in the Indian cities, which we started from one city in the Western part of India in Gujarat and scaled it to you know several other cities and states uh, in, in, in India and even helping our neighboring countries in, in devising and developing their local heat, heat health adaptation plan policies. So yes, uh, that, that's a very brief introduction uh, that I wanted to share about myself. Thank you. That was fantastic. And you've beautifully introduced the main question I wanted to ask you. And it's similar to the one I asked Diane, which is that articulation of policy, well, the articulation of pieces and I wanted to particularly ask you about policies and sort of policies and research approaches and how well do you see climate policies intersecting with culture and heritage policies and practice sort of are they fitting together well and if you could talk more about the heat that might be a wonderful example of just are they fitting together well or are there places where adjustments are needed so now when as i mentioned that i this this was really an and and very enriching experience this entire you know conference and and uh, uh, so now i can relate more about the cultural and heritage aspects that we were indirectly you know we are indirectly covering in our our, our climate change adaptation or mitigation policies and research uh, or research and policies but not addressing directly is that uh, Culture and heritage definitely has a role to play, but we are somewhere fail to recognize that, right? They, they not just have a role to play, but they have a key role to play, but we fail to recognize that. For example, when we talk about climate change mitigation in you know, research or, 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 uh, or policies, let's talk about research. When we talk about climate change mitigation research, we talk about the climate models and predictions. We talk about different, you know, uh, uh, the, the drivers that will, uh, you know, uh, that will drive the future uh, emission scenarios, which also include, let's say, land use. But then what kind of land use? What different cultures have different land use and what you know, sort of land use, be it uh, you, you know, using it as a cropland or be it using it as you know, primary vegetation or for pasture um, you know, pastures or for you know, secondary vegetation or so things like that, we, we don't uh, connect you know, these land use patterns with the cultural, uh, you know, practices. And we just use, I mean, the, the science has helped us in, you know, uh, in going to the finer scale of 0.5 by 5, you know, uh, uh, resolution that at this scale, we can, we can, we can uh, uh, simulate the, the land use and then its impact on the future climate scenario, climate change or global warming scenario. But we are not able to, you know, uh, somewhere, the culture, the people from cultural and heritage science also need to understand that what information they can bring in, which can be consolidated and used. I mean, we do understand uh, from our earlier uh, uh, speakers also that uh, science uh, tells us the science. To uh, to me, we need science. Like we 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 definitely need science. It's it bridges the gap between you know ambiguities and uncertainty uncertainties to you know, uh, more certain probabilities and possibilities. So while we need mathematical models, we also need different you know, uh, players from different sectors, including culture to come in and tell us, uh, you know, tell these, the climate scientists that what information they, they, they want to be used in those models uh, when we are talking about uh, the, uh, the mitigation projections. 
uh, when I talk about adaptation, I learned that, you know, uh, from our heat experience that those, you know, adaptation practices which were more famous, so India or Asian countries started, you know, uh, working on the heat adaptation plans later than the one in Europe and uh, the other, you know, US or the Western countries. But those practices cannot be replicated directly here. We have different cultural practices. You know, we, we live in, 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 in uh, joint families, whereas in US or in Europe, uh, the, the culture of, you know, uh, the uh, families used to live uh, just with, you know, their kids and those. So we generally don't live with elderly in European countries or in, in the Western countries, but whereas in India, it's uh, the joint family culture is like you live with your elderly and you live with uh, the uh, the vulnerable ones in your family. So there are, you know, in 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 the Western heat action plans, uh, they have a risk communication where they ask uh, they ask you to check with your neighbors, to check with your elderly. So which means that they are not living together, right? But in India, that's not the same. So we know that we live with our elderly. We need to devise it differently. We need to tell them differently what they need to communicate during the heat, uh, you know, extreme heat days. Uh, so that was part of one, uh, one of the discussions that we had in our um, adapt adaptation strategies. So yeah, things like that. Fantastic. I think you've, you've started to touch on this. And my, my final question to you, and I apologize, this is so brief, but are there any particular projects or techniques or tools that you would really like to do next that would bring some of these pieces together? And I'm going to say particularly um, disaster risk reduction with culture and heritage and public health, sort of a so, key next step. Yes. Thank you, thank you. So uh, I'll, I'll again pick from one of the comments that one of our you know uh, uh, attendees, I, I guess her name was Samia, Samia, Samaya, yeah. She, she mentioned that we need to have, you know, place knowledge experts uh, work closely with us rather than just the field knowledge experts. So we need to bring in the place knowledge experts to, to bring in the cultural part or the, you know, the local expertise into our, our policies and research. And again, as I mentioned earlier, that we need to uh, work together. So uh, not just the DRR people, but also uh, the, the climate, uh, you know, um, the climate scientists and then the health experts and then the local, you know, uh, uh, knowledge experts, they all need to work together while we are uh, talking about devising the policies for future uh, climate change mitigation or adaptation plans. Yeah. That is fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Tiwari. We need to jump to our next panelist, but I want to try and pull some threads from your contribution uh, onto her. Uh, next, uh, we have Arminia Shachatano. Is Arminia with us? Yes. There she is. <laughs> Wonderful. <I'm... laughs> we have um, next Dr. Arminia Shachatano, um, who is with multi Multilateral Relations, the Minister's Cabinet of, with the Minister Ministry of Culture of Italy. Um, Dr. Shachatano, thank you so much for joining us. As with the others, is there anything you would like to add to that very brief title introduction that you would like us to know about your background? Yes, trying to be brief, uh, <laughs> an architect by training and the red thread of my professional life is advocating for cultural role in regenerative development. So when I do so in cultural policy making, uh, yes, I'm advising the Minister of Culture of Italy on multilateral affairs and including this includes the recent G20 culture where we have dedicated a focus on culture and climate action. Uh, I previously spent six years in the European Commission uh, where I contributed to the development of the EU policy framework on cultural heritage where I pushed particularly uh, towards a more integrated participatory community-based and holistic approach to culture and heritage. And we have seen how much is fundamental this, uh, this step, essential. Uh, and I've been uh, the scientific advisor of the European Year of Cultural Heritage, we, where we have also um, included a work stream on uh, disaster risk management. Uh, there I crossed my path with both you and Naparna. Uh, you at the Stirling Castle when we were launching the Climate Heritage Network. Yep. 
and then I became one of the members of the steering committee. I'm still uh, still there. And uh, Albino uh, spoke already about the Climate Heritage Network, and uh, also with Aparna, we 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 partnered and uh, and discussed very much how much to advance on disaster uh, risk management. I think it's all. Let's go straight to the point. <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, that's such. I knew you had such a thick background. Thank you for introducing that That's so well. And the question that I have for you really, I hope draws on that and builds from it. And it's um, fundamentally, are there changes you can see that are needed to really ensure that national and some of our larger policies for heritage connect well with climate action? Are they working together well currently or can you see steps that are needed to bring heritage policy and national policy and climate together? We have seen a terrific uh, development at the international level in this direction. There is a consensus on, on these fundamental values and approaches, the ones that have been recalled today. Um, the European Year of Cultural Heritage has also proved that this works, this approach works, and in particular, linking research to the policy cycle, the cultural policy cycle. So really bringing uh, evidences and results of the research in including them in, in, the, in the whole policy cycle. This approach is crucial to face, of course, the complex issue of uh, climate change. Uh, it was very clear in the case of sustainable tourism management, community-based uh, waste uh, management, youth forum, all the examples. The, all the key stakeholders, the EU, the Council of Europe, ICROM, UNESCO, ICOM, ICOMOS, Europa Nostra, have contributed to bring to, to, to this, this picture and to accelerate innovation. And this week, I think it has it's contributed to accelerate this uh, innovation, also helping the, those different um, uh, professionals with speak different languages to meet and cross fertilize their, their thoughts. But at national level, I think that things are still uh, are different. Uh, national administrations still work in silos. Um, the opportunity to work in a more cross-sectorial way are, are less frequent, uh, but you, and you need this common language to advance in this direction, to understand each other, to practice and work together. So in the declaration of the G20 uh, presidency, there is a clear, clear uh, request to commit uh, for commitment to scale up uh, cultural dimensions into climate change policies and also to mainstream cultural consideration in the global climate agenda. So both work on both sides. We have used the opportunity of the COP26, for instance, uh, uh, to partnering with the UK to bring those considerations uh, in this important, uh, um, important uh, meeting. Uh, and we have also included in the G20 declaration, uh, maybe one way to do so is um, the, the minister have, uh, invited all parties of the, part, the parties agreement to, to consider including culture and cultural heritage in their adaptation communications. This must, might be a way to start working together across, across the sectors. Uh, the EU has set up an OMC working group, so will help at least at the European level, national administration to advance in this direction. We in Italy have included um, culture, cultural heritage in particular in our uh, national climate change adaptation strategy. It is considered a critical infrastructure. Um, but I can say that, yes, those latest consideration that we have heard this week are not there. Still in the plan, which is, I think, very much advanced, it's still considering heritage as something at risk to be protected. All these uh, uh, behavioral changes that have been stressed and that are fundamental and important are not really well enough, enough tackled. So we need to change mindsets. Uh, we need to, to integrate uh, those aspects into the ongoing uh, cultural and heritage practices. Uh, we need disruptive change, but also accompany this disruptive change by um, capacity building measures within national administration organization that to, to turn those principles into, into practice. So the policies now, yes, these aspects I say, I've been tackled by policies, but I, I'm thinking that policies should walk in the Anthropocene landscape 
um, as well, <laughs> not only experts. Uh, we need to produce tools and guidance. Uh, there are important tools just produced by the Climate Heritage Network to, to, uh, to help dismantle the barrier to climate action by cultural actors and operators uh, uh, on building reuse, on communicating the role of culture and climate action, but this is in not translated in national languages. So we need those tools in national languages. Uh, and we need to accompany those tools with the uh, uh, capacity building, upskill, reskill, so and targeted support to be sure that this change happens. And finally, and it was very clear today, we need the young professionals. We need to, to have young professionals in our administration uh, because we need this energy to keep this change going. Fantastic. Erminia, I can also already see um, as we start to pull together actions from this conference and try to figure out how do we make them actionable and talk between policy and, and ideas. Um, many things you've just described are what we need to be looking at. I have one final, hope, maybe short question uh, for you. And it's just with all of the connections that you work with, and I'm thinking particularly of the Climate Heritage Network, but all of the other organizations, are there any sets of actors or organizations, institutions, so forth, that you really, you would love to bring together that are not yet together? Like if you could design the next panel, who would you like to be there? I'm sorry, but we need everyone on the, on the driving seat. Yep. We can't leave anyone. This is, I think it's very challenging to make a selection because it's, yep. we need to address these topics in, in a holistic way. So we need all the visions. Uh, we have seen that when we forget one of the, of the important key stakeholders on an actor, then you miss a, a fundamental piece of the, of the landscape. So I can, I see, yes, artists, local communities, um, people who really has the traditional knowledge. Otherwise, we will never acknowledge the power of the arts and culture for, for climate action. Perfect. Yes, we need all the parts. That could not be better said. Um, thank you so much. Um, I wish we could go on, but I, we need to jump to our next one. So thank you so much. Um, and our next panelist is Dr. Uh, Mr. Joseph King. Mr. King, are you available? There he is. I am. Great. Uh, so we have uh, with us Mr. Joseph King, Director, Partnership and Communications with ECROM. Um, thank you so much for joining. And as we've been asked, as I have been asking everyone, is there anything you would like to add to that brief title introduction that you would like us to know about your, your work that you're bringing to this panel? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Marcy. Actually, that title doesn't tell you anything about me. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I, I do have to say, I do have to say at least a couple of things. So um, I'm actually from Washington, DC, where you're sitting right now, I think. Um, and I got my start in conservation, actually, as a US Peace Corps volunteer uh, in Kenya, where I worked on an urban conservation project in Mombasa in Kenya. And uh, for that reason, actually, I was incredibly happy to see um, the case studies today from LAMO and from also from uh, the Seychelles, uh, because it's a it's an area of the world that's really very close to my close to my heart. Um, after uh, after that, um, I well, I'm an architect and I'm an urban planner, and I came to Rome in the mid 1990s and started working at Ecrom around 1996, and I've been at Ecrom for a little more than 25 years now, uh, mostly working uh, with um, the World Heritage Convention. I've been sort of heading up ECROM's work on World Heritage for about 25 years and also working on other projects like the Africa 2009 program and um, uh, well, a variety of other uh, activities that we do for training and capacity building. So that's in a nutshell uh, who I am. Fantastic. Um and I, that's, I wanted to build on that a bit with the first question I'm going to throw at you, and it, that ha it has to do with site management. And it's almost, I've come to think of it as a basic climate heritage sort of question, but that doesn't decrease its import. It's that as climate change accelerates and the stresses that climate change is bringing accelerate, 
there's going to be more damage to heritage places we recognize as heritage and heritage sites, and including some loss. And so the question I want to ask you is, are there changes needed in how we approach the management of heritage sites and heritage places to address these growing impacts? And what might some of those changes be? Um, thank you. Thank you for the question. I, I think it's, a, it's an interesting one. And I, you talked about loss. And yeah. I think I, I mean, I do understand that that's one possibility in, in places, but I actually per, prefer to think about change. It's change. And that change can be that change can be negative and, you know, and lead to loss. It can also be positive, I think. And I think there are a lot of factors that go into that. I think the climate, obviously, the climate question is probably the one that's the most uh, heavily um, on our minds at this moment, and obviously certainly part of this this uh, this conference. Um, but you know, there are things related to urbanization. There's rapid urbanization. There's technology. There's tremendous changes in technology. There's immigration related issues, um, and there are positive changes. Cultures cultures change. <laughs> That's what they do. That's what they are. I mean, there's no cultures are not um, you know are not static, and so we have to understand that we're going to have those changes and some of them are going to be negative and lead to loss and some of them are actually going to be positive and lead to changes in our relationship to the heritage uh creation of new heritage changes in use in relation to the heritage and so i think i think the first thing that we need to do as site managers is we need to actually think about this in a much more broad in a in a, in a broad sense and try to understand all of the various uh aspects of of gain and loss related to climate and related to these other factors that, that we're going to have to, you know, that we're, we're going to have to deal with. So, uh, you know, this has been said a lot already, and I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm the last speaker, but I, I'm the second to last speaker, and so some of this is going to be what you've heard already. But you know, to me, the main thing that site managers have to do, and and people especially related to site management for heritage, is um, adopt these people-centered approaches that we've been talking about all week long. Um, and we've seen some really fantastic examples of that uh, over the course of the week, and certainly actually in the presentations that we had earlier today. Um, and I think those are really great examples, but I think the problem is, is that most of us pay lip service, <laughs> but then, they, you know, but they don't actually do it. Um, I, I think it was Diane, I think it was Diane Douglas who said uh, check boxes you know, in the in the impact in the impact assessment studies and things like that, we need to get away from the check boxes, and we actually need to get to the fact that all of us in the heritage field need to start adopting these people centered approaches. And this and that those people centered approaches mean that we're not the bosses anymore. <laughs> you know, we need to listen, <laughs> and we need to you know learn. I noticed in the chats people were talking about learn. You know, we need to listen and we need to learn before we speak. Because we are not very good at that. We're usually really good at speaking first and then maybe, you know, trying to bring in other people's points of view in a, in a second instance. And, and I think we need to change the way we work. And I think that's, to me, the, you know, the biggest thing that we're that we're going to need that we're going to need to do. Now, I think that's going to lead to us in a number of cases, uh, having to revalue or reevaluate our heritage, understand it in different ways. Um, and I think that's okay. And I, there's nothing wrong with that. I think we do need to, to, to do that. Um, and I think we need to build those reevaluations uh, into our systems of management and monitoring of our management. And, and I think we need to, you know, we need to understand that at periodic moments, we're going to have to take a step back. We're going to have to continue to speak with the people that we're working with. Again, not you know, not our stakeholders, but they're working with us. They are, you know, they're the managers along with us, and we're going to need to, and we're going to need to reevaluate, uh, reevaluate that heritage over time. The other thing that we're going to need to do is is widen our circle of knowledge. You talked about this already, so I don't need to talk about the relationship between heritage and the climate scientists or the the climate world. But we we as heritage people need to start listening more to the climate people to understand, you know, to really understand what's going on in our on our on our sites. Um, but I would actually say that we need to broaden out even much more than that. And, you know, the, the example that I'll use, I mean, there are more than this one example I'm going to give you, but, um, you know, I sit in Rome, Ecrum is in Rome, and that's been my home for the last 20, uh, 25 years. Um, we have FAO, uh, we have all of the food, you know, the food based, uh, UN agencies here, FAO, uh, IFAD, uh, World Food Program, et cetera. Well, we're going to have to talk to those people also because Climate change is going to affect how we grow our food, which is about basically our lives. 
And, um, and we're gonna need to learn from that. And that's gonna change our, just strictly from the heritage point of view, that's gonna change our landscapes. I mean, how we grow our food is, 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 you know, is related to our landscapes, but it's also related to how we live again. So it becomes a people-centered issue again. It's not just what the, our landscapes look like, that is going to be an issue. What do our landscapes look like? But it's also just going to be the relationship of the people to the places that they live and the, and the landscapes that they live. So I think, you know, we really need to open ourselves up to a variety of different uh, different actors and, 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 and knowledge sources, traditional knowledge, uh, climate knowledge, uh, agricultural knowledge. Um, and, and this will be my, just my last point to close out, is, and we're going to need to integrate even the heritage field, we're still not so good at integrating the built heritage or the or the immovable heritage sector with the movable heritage sector with the you know with the museum or objects related uh, uh, conservation people. And Diane uh, actually spoke very eloquently, so I don't need to go too much into it. But the culture nature, and we've seen such great examples of that again over the course of this week and over the course of, of this afternoon. Um, but that culture nature. Uh, integration and is something so important. We've been starting to do that now with IUCN, ECROM, ECOMOS, the World Heritage Center. Uh, we've all been trying, you know, to, to, to start building those bridges. But, but if you ask me 25 years ago when I started in World Heritage, if, the, if, if I thought that the culture people and the nature people would actually be working together, I would have said no. I mean, I, I would have laughed at that point in time. We've come a long way and I think that's something very good. Fantastic. You've just you've hit on so many points. Um, and it, the final question I was going to ask you is about capacities and what ECROM should do next. Um, a point I asked that I particularly ask you about <laughs> that. <laughs> so well, so I just wanted to give you a little bit of that space. Are there specific things that you can see that need to be done to do some more of this integration and the bringing together? Well, I think, you know, I mean, ECROM, you know, ECROM has been working on this, pe these people centered approaches for a long time now. So, I mean, it's not a, con the concept is not, is not foreign to us. We've yeah. been working on integration through World Heritage Leadership, for example, with culture and nature. So, I mean, we've been doing that. Um, I think, um, you know, I think we need to keep doing that. I think we need to start going down more to the local level. Now that's hard for us to do because we're intergovernmental. So, you know, we've got 136 member states at the moment and, you know, going down and really talking to communities at that level are hard, but through, we've developed these models more recently of, you know, doing uh, uh, training or capacity building activities, but then working with some of the people who are in those activities at the local level, once they go back and having mentors and having uh, having research projects and having um, you know having an ability to actually learn more from what's going on the ground, because when you bring people together, that exchange is actually very important. But they need to get that back to the ground, and and we need to actually get back to the ground uh, to be able to um, to be able to mine those experiences, if I can use that that wording, so that we can then create tools and actually then share that again. Uh, at, a, at a wider at a wider level, so programs like World Heritage Leadership programs like FAR, which this this is an example of that. I mean, this conference is a really good example of how ECROM, you know, can 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 try to bring all of these ex uh, experiences together and and share them, uh, you know, in, in in a wider in a wider way. So these are the kinds of things that that we need to continue doing, and and. Uh, and we need to touch more people, I would say, on the ground and do that through FAR and through World Heritage Leadership and through the Africa Youth. Actually, we've, we've been focusing a lot on youth also. We have a new program called, you know, um, Africa Heritage, uh, Youth Heritage Africa. Um, and, and again, I mean, getting to our youth is, is another way that, that, that we can do that at, at ECROM. So, yeah, we're working on it, but it's, uh, it, it'll, be a never, it'll be a never ending work. Right. But that's OK. There's no problem with that. We'll keep doing it. Thank you. It's, it's never done, but it's keeping yeah. the momentum and the energy going. That's so important. Thank you so much, Joe. Pleasure. Um, yeah. Um, our next panelist is Dr. June Tabaroff, if June is available. Hello. Oh. There she is. Wonderful. Uh, so our next panelist is Dr. June Tabaroff, a Senior Cultural Resource Specialist and Independent Consultant. And with that, I want to ask you our first question of could, would you please add to that description and tell us, share with us a little bit more about the background you're bringing to today? Yes, and thank you for including me in the panel. Um, I think some of the most relevant work I've done recently are two 
papers which I've co-authored, one for the British Council on culture, climate change and culture, focusing on East Africa. And that's available on the um, website of the British Council. And then I'm just finishing up another piece of work for the European Commission on the Green Deal, the European Green Deal and culture, looking particularly at what the EU terms the external dimension, which is foreign aid. So those two um, pieces of work have given me a really great um, opportunity to, to look at these, these areas um, in, in more depth. I also have a lot of experience of field projects in, in Africa, among other regions. And I've been doing some recent work on improving guidance for environmental assessment for the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, among other agencies. So um, a, a bit of a, an overview of, of um, my background. I also should say I have a long association with ECROM. I started my interest in, in, in conservation at ECROM, and I'm trained as an art and architectural historian. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much for, for bringing that in. And it's your recent writing and research work in Africa that I wanted to pull out for our first Good. question. Uh, and one of my question, the, the question is, it sort of draws on, and I'm, I'm looking at Arminia's box on the Zoom as well, and thinking of some of the big policies and programs that are coming together for heritage. But throughout this conference, we've been emphasizing the importance of place and local knowledge and people who are there. And I'm speaking as someone who did a national strategy for the US in terms of heritage and climate. But one of the things I don't know is, are some of the strategies or approaches that are being developed for climate change and heritage outside of Africa, do they work well in Africa or are there some more local considerations that they don't capture that need to be addressed? Um, is there any customization or additional things that we need to know in order to better understand the challenges and, and potentials of the heritage that, and climate. That's, a, that's a, a, a very large set it's of questions. And we're dealing with, with a very, very large and um, diverse continent. Yeah. Um, I think, let me just step back a little, a moment and say um, what I think something of the situation in Africa in overall, some both, and I say that's a very mixed picture. So I think, you know, on the positive side, there is some progress in cultural heritage legislation, for example, in Malawi, something I worked on, the, the legal frameworks, which are really very important. There's a greater understanding of the contribution of intangible cultural heritage. Um, and this new round of UNESCO of the intangible cultural heritage periodic reports is a huge opportunity. Uh, alert everyone, think about that. They've just done the first round in Latin America where they do talk a little bit about climate change and culture and intangible culture. So that's a big, um, something important for Africa. I think there's a wider understanding of, of heritage resources in Africa, such as cultural landscapes and crafts and so forth. However, Cultural heritage is still really poorly known, both at the national and at the international level. And even less known is this, the linkage between climate change and habitat um, degradation. Why is that the case? Overall, this is a quick rundown. First of all, weak, very weak, generally weak government institutions and civil society organizations thin on the ground. I'm currently working in Ethiopia. There are very few, I mean, there are a number of civil society organizations, but very few working in the, this heritage area. So that, and, I mean, there's in other, you know, other settings, for example, uh, Uganda has a, has a much more vibrant civil society scene. And it, it's hard to generalize, but I'd say that that's pretty true. Um, very inadequate. Legal, you know, legal enforcement, out of date legislation. For example, there is not in most legislation, there's no concept of conservation areas or even intangible heritage is really not explicitly mentioned. 
<clears throat> another opportunity really is environmental and social impact assessment. In most countries in Africa, it's not really seriously applied. We have this great example now um, that we heard today from our colleague from Chad. Um, that's a huge opportunity to really integrate understanding of culture. Another problem is that even though UNESCO requires management plans for its sites, they're often on paper only. I mean, I can say that for pretty clear. Uh, Ethiopia is a good case in point. Again, opportunity. Um, and I think really a key thing is that the wider community benefit of cultural heritage has not been well articulated or defended. Therefore, neither in the context of climate change or in reconciliation and peace building. That, that's really where a gain could be. There's poor um, interagency coordination and the weakest link is often the Ministry of Culture. They are not even sitting at the table in these discussions. Um, and at the point that I really wanna emphasize is the very low levels of funding, um, either from government's own funding or for donors. Without funding, it's very hard to do this seriously. I mean, being a volunteer is one thing, but you have to get access to some funding. Funding's out there, but it's not going to, in general. It's, you know, very little is dedicated for culture, cultural heritage, the arts and, in Africa. And um, therefore, you know, it's, it, those issues remain very much at the the, the margins. Moreover, in Africa, and this is a big constraint, you have increasing, well, I mean, maybe it's because they're in the paper more, but there's a tremendous amount of conflict, whether if it's in Ethiopia, Sudan, Burkina Faso, Mozambique, and those are real deterrents for investment. So though, you know, that's, I would say, is some kind of like global view. And remember, of course, there are differences among each of the countries. Of course. No, thank you. You just touched on so many points. I'm like, okay, I want to pull out that one. I want to pull <laughs> out that one. <laughs> um, there's one particular question that I did want to ask you based on your recent report yeah. um, and also pulling on some of the points that Joe just made regarding agriculture and food. I think you've written mm -hmm. a bit about biocultural approaches and food security. And so I wanted to ask you if you had um, any recommendations for realizing some of the potential to connect heritage, food security, um, and biocultural diversity. Again, I do, and I really pass, thank you. For question. Question. <laughs> I, really, um, I really thank you for that question because it's 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 gotten me so interested, and I have a great recommendation for everyone: a book that has a terrific title, which is called <clears throat> "Eating to Extinction." which is written by a British journalist. And in that he looks at, I mean, it's based on case studies. I think they're 25, but there's three extremely interesting ones from Africa. One is this amazing story of honey gathering in, um, let me think where that is. In, um, let's see, honey, the honey gathering is among the Hadza in Tanzania. Then there's the story of banana growing in Uganda, a particular, and the 30 different varieties. And the third um, case study is on wild forest honey, I mean, uh, coffee in Ethiopia. So in each of those cases, there's this amazing biodiversity and this, um, and which is being lost. And what's really important is how these foodstuffs are important for, for um, life really, not only for nutrition, and there's a fantastic stories of how this particular honey is so um, rich in nutrition or these different kinds of bananas used in different ways. But what's so interesting is how important they are for ritual, for um, all kinds of I mean, the different meanings of life. So that's, that's kind of an interesting point of view on that. But I think in terms of what, what um, need to do is 
would be to develop a better understanding of food production in Africa, how it's affected by climate change and by habitat destruction. So, and doing that, working with communities. The archeological record is also extremely important yeah. for that. Um, of course, we should really cite the work of the FAO and IUCN and World um, uh, Fund for, for, for Wildlife Fund. All of these, there are many, and, and different national commissions and so forth. So there is, there is work being done, but often the cultural perspective is missing. Another thing is, as I say, is to engage, not only to know what these other people are doing, but to really engage with them. And that is both practical projects as well as research. And I could also cite the Global Environmental Facility, which has a number of small grants and they've done some fascinating work that has, whether it's rice growing or other things um, that have extremely important. And I would also say that both the EU and the World Bank in their programs have um, either agricultural livelihood programs that are definitely closely tied. So those are things, all things to keep an eye on. And then a thing I think that's important is to um, you know, start doing more pilot programs and projects and gather that evidence and then see how they can be either replicated or enlarged. And you know, the British Council has made a small start on that through its cultural protection fund. And there's several good projects. They're not really aimed at, at food, but there are good examples of, of local initiatives that can be scaled up. Um, and then I think the fourth thing is you really need to develop a communication plan. How are people gonna know about this? Because that's a great failing. You may do really good work, but then no one knows about it. And in that context, I'd echo what my other colleagues have said on the panel. You have all of the, the talents of the artistic community and um, they are so important in, in energizing the debate in, and making it relevant. So whether it's through music, whether it's through arts, dance, theater, um, I think that that's one of the real strengths of the arts and culture sector is that um, there's that talent base. And it's, you know we've all had that experience of being more affected by a photograph than a 40 page report. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Do you, you've just captured so much there um, and you've started to answer the final piece that I wanted yeah. to ask you, which is any specific recommendations or ideas you have for safeguarding or working with heritage, particularly in Africa. And I'm gonna narrow that down a tiny bit um, and just ask, are there particular pilot projects or subjects for an art project that you know of that you would particularly like to work with? Do you have um, any ideas that you can um, see that you'd like to well, develop? Well, that's, um, yeah, I think the, the, um, the three initial projects of the uh, British Council Cultural Protection Fund, um, those have very interesting approaches and they're beginning to show some good results. In Uganda, there's a melting snow project, which also dealt with conflict resolution, this um, citizen science project in Tanzania, which I think is excellent. And then um, okay, there's one other project that that's, um, I can't think of at the moment, but I think, you know, in all of those projects, what I'd like to, what I'd like to see is um, developing a, a data, you know, some kind of real rigorous evidence base because that's, that's what speaks to policymakers. If you can say, we've invested X amount of money and we can point to these results, it's improved the livelihoods of X number of communities, um, that sort of thing. But um, without that evidence base, it's very hard to uh, convince funders. So I think one has to really think about how, how we can move from, you know, a position where we're all convinced ourselves to influencing others and not only influencing them, but getting them to dig into their pockets and say, okay, you know, we're willing to try, try this. And whether, you know, it could be a tourism related project, it can be an urban project, it can be 
um, a, a, something at the landscape scale. You know, there, there are many different opportunities. And for another very good project was the, um, you, the um, Sudan Community Museums. That's another, you know, overlooked in general in the Africa region, how museums can really become an active force for um, raising awareness and expression of culture and, and a climate debate. Fantastic. June, you have so many uh, examples and projects in your mind. This has been <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> I wish I could ask you even more questions. We need to move on to our last panel. Right. So thank, thank you, you very so much, much for all of these contributions. <laughs> Pleasure. Fantastic. And our final panelist, but absolutely not least, as we say, um, is Ms. Stephanie Grant. Stephanie, I can see your video. I'll bring you over. Yeah. Perfect, there you are. So finally, we have uh, Ms. Stephanie Grant, who is Senior Program Manager at the British Council Cultural Protection Fund. Uh, Stephanie, welcome. Thank you so much for being here um, through all of this. Um, as with everyone else, I want to ask, I've just given your title. Can you give us a bit more of your background that you're bringing to today's conversation? Well, I can be pretty quick because, <laughs> um, I oversee the Cultural Protection Fund that does what it says. Um, we support projects which protect heritage at risk. Initially, that was due to conflict, but we've since expanded our remit to protect heritage against climate change. And we're, we're heading in a direction of continuing to work across these areas and they intertwine and they overlap. And um, yeah, of, of course, we know they're linked and they're, they're going to become sort of less distinct as our programme continues. Um, my background actually is in, is in funding, particularly for international collaborations across arts and culture. Um, and I am by no means an expert, so I am I'm here to listen and, and feed back the expertise that's gathered through this conference as, as we design future programmes. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, and I think I'm going to pull on something that that June was saying, uh, and a question we were thinking of to ask you is that after the presentations um, and discussions that you've had a chance to see, do you have any ideas on some ways in which funding organizations can support research or just action, some of the actions that have been discussed here? Are there new funding or sources or mechanisms that are needed? And what might these look like if you have some of those ideas? I mean, yeah, speaking from a, a cultural protection fund perspective, outside of our usual funding mechanism, we've been able to commission and support some research, just um, like the report that, that June just mentioned um, yeah. about um, exploring best practice in, in heritage against the effects of climate change. Um, but then listening to Nick earlier talk about the walking seminars and, and see all of the excitement about those on the chat has made me realise that we need to have a much more open mind to what research methods are and to what research outputs are, um, which has been really inspiring and I, I will I'll take that away. Just through our usual grant giving mechanism, um, we've been in the process of, of piloting a way that, um, that support projects to take the first step towards protecting heritage. So that's either research and scoping, you know, identifying and analyzing needs, developing capacity in organizations, that um, kind of thing. And, you know, giving organizations the time to properly make connections with, with communities and, and with, you know, other agencies to, to properly plan and, and develop a project. But th this kind of work needs for a funder to have a bigger appetite for risk that things might not work out as planned. And for us, that feels conflicting because um, we are distributing public money and we face a lot of scrutiny, but I think part of that solution, and it's been mentioned already, is, is how we communicate to the outside world about the benefit of heritage protection. And it's much as much about the process as it is um, about, the, about the finished outcome. Um, from everything Diane was saying about how heritage improves quality of life, and you know, we we know that, but and we need to be better at putting people at the center of our communication about heritage protection. That's a bit of a call of action to myself. <laughs> and then a call to action to anyone on the call and to reiterate what June just said is that we need evidence. So if you have a case study or a quote or a poem that has come out of some research, 
um, then yeah, we, it's great to have this kind of platform to share that because the more that we can share across each other and across our networks, the better that we can make the case for, for future funding for, yeah, for bigger and better things. Fantastic. I think you touched a bit on, on one issue that I want to pull out is that sort of uncertainty. Um, well, it's, it's those unconventional forms of work and how do we bring in new forms of work? And so I have sort of a, a two pronged question, but I'll try to bring it together. Is that from the funding side, recognizing all of your responsibilities for the funding, but also all of the unpredictability that climate change is bringing and all of the calls we've seen throughout this week to bring together new collaborations in new and inventive ways. I think it's that, is there a way to work more flexibility into the funding mechanisms that we have to al allow for those different partnerships and the unpredictability that we're dealing with? Yeah, I mean, in, in terms of the uncertainty, that, that means so many different things at you know, the crossroads of heritage protection and, and climate change. And you, know, you could argue that it's a difficult thing to be prepared for something when you don't know what it is that you're right. preparing for. But, um, you know, watching the film with the indigenous people of Australia and, and, and that talk of the sort of ancient wisdom. So are we actually, are some of those uncertainties are well known by some communities? So are, are we asking for input at, yeah. at the right time? So I think there are some things that we deem unpredictable when perhaps they're not. Um, and then definitely in terms of the, the partnerships, um, you, we're, we're sort of acutely aware that cultural heritage isn't the top of the priority list for everyone, um, you know, during times of crisis or, you know, in certain needs in communities and there's complexity and, and, and layers, but again, it comes back to sort of learning from each other um, um, and from our successes, but from our mistakes as well and being a little bit more honest about when things haven't gone so well, which is, is difficult for people, especially when it comes to funding, because that might mean that it's harder to get future funding, but um, we're, we're talking um, as, as a fund to a network of funders. So what we're trying to do is like discuss common issues um, and, and, and therefore, you know, we're, we're learning about it together rather than individually as funders. And then, uh, yeah, I, I think in terms of flexibility, that's been something that's been really difficult for us particularly in, in, the, in the CPF for the last couple of years. Um, uh, you know, time is something we've, we've struggled a lot with. So, um, but, but actually when we haven't had the luxury of supporting multi-year projects that we can be really flexible in, we have been able to support this very conference. So, you know, perhaps everything is, is an opportunity. Um, and that's just made me think about, you know, the ecosystem of the different kinds of activities that, that are needed in order to join the dots. So that could be more time convening organizations like this and more time doing the research and the development stuff. And again, like I said, this, this whole, um, just today's session has been a huge um, learning thing for me. And, and I think it's about time that yes, we listen to the needs that are on the ground to develop our funding programs. And that's, that's absolutely something I, I'll take away. Fantastic. And just the final question piece, because I've been wanting to try to ask everyone this, um, and we'd love to hear your ideas, is just next steps. Are there, you said you've been learning a lot, are there next steps that you think you can see you can do or that you might be able to work with at the British Council? Well, this is a really oh. crucial time for us yeah. in, in CPF because we're just at the point where we know we've got future funding and we are designing you know, new new programs. And so this is a great, you know, font of knowledge that we can we can feed into that and also feed back into the network of funders. Um, so there's that. And then I think it's already been said is just keeping that momentum and keeping that, you know, this as a network, but not not a not a network that seems inaccessible. So that it's it's a place that organizations and individuals and communities can access information about you know about climate change and about heritage so I, I guess it's it's all about keeping this sort of sharing and, and learning and convening going the immediate next steps but actually we have some practical ones in terms of how we're you know developing our programs. Fantastic I just I can't say thank 
thank you enough. And that's just wrapped it. You've wrapped it up beautifully. And I want to say thank you to all of the panelists for your thoughtful answers to some enormous um, and complex questions. You've just added so much. Um, Aparna, I think we're ready for our final set of actions. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. And thank you to all the panelists right from the Ignite Talks to our, this uh, great uh, group of uh, speakers. I would now like to bring on Christopher Malapitan, who has been capturing all this very quietly in the background. Chris, over to you. Yes. Thank you, Aparna. I am going to now share my screen. Yes, thank you all very much for a very rich discussion. I, as Aparna mentioned, I was in the background taking some notes. So I tried my best to capture some of the main ideas. Um, so um, there was a lot of attention uh, on, on communities and involving communities in the plan. Uh, we learned a lot about how um, the mixture of traditional and science knowledge is very important and as well as involving women is, uh, was very uh, prominent in the, in the, the sharing. Uh, regarding um, funding, um, yes, it's, it is very important to, to promote the, the benefits of uh, uh, the, the protection of cultural heritage, but it's also just as important to, to increase the local capacity so we can then build that solidarity into the messaging. Um, a, a few more things that I also noticed was regarding um, policy, especially how uh, best to make, uh, make culture more uh, relevant is really connect uh, culture to land use so, so that policy can actually see how it all connects, but also how it brings in meaning and more value. And of course, uh, finally, uh, engaging the youth, engaging young professionals uh, everywhere from um, within communities, within policy, within uh, civil society, uh, the youth uh, are super important in, in bringing in the message. So I thank you very much. And of course, this visual will be shared with all of you. And if you do feel that there is something is missing or something you feel you would like to enhance, please enter that into the, into the chat and then we will share this with you. Thank you. Partner, you're on you're on oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, sharing that very rich image, uh, Chris. And uh, um, since we are um, really quite behind schedule, uh, I would like to now uh, share briefly with you, there, 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 this uh, conference has been a, a huge undertaking and it would not have been you know, possible without our partners, uh, as I said, 55 of them, we have not been naming them. It's very difficult to list all of them, uh, uh, but they are, there is more information available about these partners in, uh, on our website. Uh, you can um, you know, log into the Climate Culture Peace uh, web portal, uh, which will also record all these in conversations will offer video playlist, ECROM website will also offer video playlist, and we will have case studies coming up on this web uh, portal. This will also form as a, you know, continuing uh, a platform for continuing these discussions, these rich discussions. And uh, now I would like to just share a quick video of the statements that have come in uh, from our various partners. They're still coming in. We are, our email box is inundated with messages. But uh, this is a moment of just looking at these, reading these statements as my uh, colleagues will bring up the video and just to uh, absorb how many uh, institutions around the world have been working and have given scientific input and knowledge exchange 
and it is all uh, voluntary and it's all in the spirit of building knowledge together and coming together around a cause. So let's watch the video. Thank you. Thank you to all our partners. It's, 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 it's a bit overwhelming, so forgive me if I'm a bit emotional. Now I would like to share the final, uh, you know, uh, beginnings of the uh, agenda, an action agenda, because that's what we had, in a, you know, uh, in a way, uh, promised to ourselves, to our partners, and to our uh, supporters, and, uh, you know, um, British Council has been, and the Cultural Protection Fund have been invaluable in their support. And uh, so we would like to, with Marcy together, I would like to share a, um, a small uh, presentation on which outlines the beginning of an action agenda, what next after this conference. But this is not complete because this was a very uh, intense and we, a week where we received a lot of input and beyond our expectations. And we are still trying to unpack the, the uh, discussions and the input stories, ideas, experiences we have gathered. We will be uh, working with our partners to uh, actually reflect on it because uh, this needs more reflection. And based on that, we will be uh, finalizing this action agenda, but I just wanted to uh, give um, an outline and share an outline. So Marcy, I hope you're ready. Uh, I will start sharing my screen and uh, just allow me to share my screen. So um, just a minute. Um, I'll speak the first point and then Marcy will, will go very quickly and not, uh, you know, stay over it uh, too much because, okay. So the first point is that uh, with this, uh, we would like together as partners increase awareness that heritage is essentially non-material. It is a complex people-centered and ongoing process which uses memory, associations, things and places to affirm identities create or dismantle power structures and address contemporary social and political problems, as well as navigate change 
and we will be working more and uh, you know with leading lights such as Dr. Laura Jean Smith, who set the tone for uh, you know who helped us to come to this uh, conclusion that for uh, addressing these contemporary issues uh, such as uh, are, are the, the uncertainty or to deal with unpredictability of our times, we need to uh, move towards a more people-focused uh, discourse, which has come through again and again through various discussions. And over to you, Marcy. Great, I think if you can navigate to the next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do that. Okay, oops, sorry. Here we go. So the next action is to build understanding that climate change has a history which intersects with heritage in multiple ways, feeding into root causes of disasters and conflicts, and at the same time, offering opportunities for sparking innovation and community-based actions. One of the things that I've come to say over the past several years is we must understand that climate change didn't begin with some of our modern measurements uh, or recognitions in the late 20th century, climate change itself has a history and how does it intersect with those um, and how do we build that awareness is definitely a next step that we need to work on. Aparna, back to you. Thank you. And the other recommendation and action step that we are coming up, we are beginning to outline is that we need to invest in researching histories of adaptation and changing meanings and uses of heritage for people in a place. And uh, again, this is something that we have, uh, that has resonated over and over through various panels and discussions in this conference. Over to you, Marcy. Okay. Our next one is we need to build mechanisms and partnerships for people-centered approaches for adaptation and managing change, moving away from technocratic and top-down solutions. And as support for this, I'm going to point to that wonderful panel that I just had the chance to talk with, um, is how do we bring all of our action down to the ground um, and engage all of the different collaborations and sources of knowledge and all of the visions that are involved in it. Especially the walking tours. <laughs> yes. That will remain with us, right? So thank you, Nick. So being, uh, bring all human emotions, and that was said by June, human need for story into how we talk about climate change and design actions. So that has to come through. And I think uh, Dr. Um, Mishai Mangola gave us a wonderful start in this conference with her performance, for which, uh, you know, which we will, again, we will uh, highlight it in our playlist. Over to you, Marcy. Great. Next one is we need to develop common language that enables working with people and across boundaries. And to this idea, I'm also going to add the capacity for dialogue just before this ending closing session started. There was a workshop held by the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience, specifically on dialogue and how we can ask each other better questions to help us listen and build a common set of understandings. Yes. Aparna, back to you. Dialogue, we must. We also have to develop policies, frameworks, and tools for changing the culture of overconsumption within the heritage culture sector. And this morning we had this uh, great panel where um, even uh, initiatives like uh, digital transformation uh, were discussed and like how much are we talking about digital transformation transformation and what is the carbon footprint of that digital transformation. So we need to critically see within this sector how we are uh, contributing to uh, climate change. So I think that is a very important aspect. Next to you, Marcy. Great. Next is we need to train heritage decision makers and practitioners to develop community-led approaches to adapt to change and deal with complexity as well as uncertainty. And there's so much that goes into this and I'm looking at the concept of training and practitioners and I'm thinking of all of the energy that Rapal brought in from the youth forum and that sense of training and education and how do we build, but also 
not just learn rote things, but learn learn how to change. And as we were saying in the chat earlier, how do we learn how to learn? And how do we learn how to unlearn? That is awesome. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so moving on, uh, develop concept conceptual frameworks, policies, and tools that capture the duality of heritage. That is how heritage can increase vulnerability to the disruptions and variability brought on by climate change, and how heritage contributes to capacities for mitigation and adaptation. So we recognize that dual, dual role uh, or you know, aspect that heritage processes play and uh, we need more frameworks and more tools to understand, to capture that duality uh, in our practice, in our policies, and also in research, I think. Next is to you, Marcy, for okay. you. <clears throat> Great, and our next is create shareable and replicable tools for assessing risk for people and heritage elements, both for slow onset cumulative processes, as well as shocks and disruptions. And this is one of our challenges or charge statements coming out of all of the examples um, and needs and questions and issues that have been shared throughout this week. When we create things and tools to address them, how do we make sure that they're not only shareable, but how do we build that capacity uh, to use them across different places and different groups? Thank you. And the next is develop frameworks and on the ground mechanisms for greater collaboration between different sectors, local communities and governments to better understand risks and find solutions that are inclusive, fair and provide a future for people, their heritage and the planet we live on. And it's a direct quote from our partners from Australia ICOMOS, Catherine Forbes and dot 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 this will continue, this reflection will continue and we will have much more consolidated report uh, after we have uh, had the chance to uh, you know, discuss this further with our partners and develop uh, um, and really uh, understand what this past week has, uh, the insights that have been shared with us in over this past week and uh, we will be sharing it at the end of uh, uh, within a month's time this report uh, widely through ecrom channels and our partners networks um, last but not the least what ecrom's far program is going to do ecrom's far program is very pleased uh, to announce that uh, thanks to the uh, uh, support of the Swedish Postcode Foundation and building on uh, climate culture peace, we have been, uh, we are going to develop a two year capacity development action on net zero heritage for climate action. It's a multi-level capacity development project uh, and it will include uh, uh, having five innovation sites where we will develop, uh, we will, where we will um, try to cross link data and work across disciplines, uh, you know, bring cultural, um, uh, cultural knowledge and uh, also cross link that with climate change and variability data. Be working in places where the stress, uh, environmental stresses are most visible and where heritage is endangered. And uh, we will try to develop uh, mitigation and adaptation solutions, working with communities uh, and try to also come up with some tools, some of the aspects that we have outlined in this um, action agenda. And uh, with that, I would like to stop sharing my screen and uh, thank all of you for your attention. Um, this is a time when, bear with me, I will take some time to thank our partners and our panelists one by one. I would also like to thank all the moderators, all the speakers, all the contributors, our attendees for uh, uh, working and joining us for these discussions. And despite the rise in COVID infections, many of our panelists could not join us and our, I wish them speedy recovery and I thank them for, uh, for their time and energy. But uh, 
most of all, I'm really grateful to the team of Climate Culture Peace, uh, my colleagues, Ms. Mohana Chakravarti, uh, Ms. Juhi Ambani, Mr. Anthony uh, Risk, Mr. Joao Ottone, uh, Ms. Kelly Haziagar, uh, from Ikram colleagues uh, from uh, who have joined us, Marco Kara, who's still sitting with IT support, uh, his colleague Franco, uh, uh, Dilum uh, Chaminda from our logistics team, uh, Giuseppe uh, Chofi from our logis logistics team, Isabel De Brises, uh, Rahel Walde Mikael, our accounts department. There are many, many people who have been working day and night and have been helping us to uh, bring this conference together. And uh, we are also grateful to all the ICRAM colleagues and the Director General of ICRAM for supporting us in this initiative. Thank you. Thank you so much to everyone. And thank you for your attention. Uh, goodbye. And for now, goodbye. I hope we will continue the dialogue. Thank you. <laughs>